Hello, and welcome to the Active Inference Lab. Today is April 14th, 2021, and we're here in guest stream number 4.1 with Elliot Murphy. So this is gonna be a really interesting talk, and Elliot, we appreciate you coming on. So I'll just pass it to you to introduce yourself, introduce the topic, and then share some slides. So anyone who's watching live, or I guess later in the comments, just ask questions and we'll have time during this presentation and at the end to go over some comments. But thanks again, Elliot, and looking forward to hearing this. Awesome, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I am a, a postdoc working at UT Health uh, in Houston, Texas. I work on intracranial recordings of uh, epilepsy patients, uh, doing a bunch of language tasks, trying to explore the neural basis of language. Uh, and today I I'm gonna present uh, some slides kind of reviewing um, a recent preprint that is currently in review on active inference and the free energy principle. So I'm just going to share my, share my screen. Yep, looks good. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to give you um, an introduction to the topic and then talk a bit about linguistics and then try and wrap up. Um, you know, we'll, we'll make this more of a, obviously a conversation, uh, comments, questions, uh, objections, obviously uh, more than welcome for anybody. So yeah, like I said, this is the preprint that's currently uh, in review uh, with Emma Holmes and Carl Friston at UCL. Uh, the argument is that natural language syntax complies in some degree with the free energy principle. So just um, outlining some kind of really core, uh, you know, basic principles. I want to make this uh, conversation a little bit more philosophical than 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 normal. And um, obviously, this is this this lab is an active inference lab, so I want to kind of introduce some linguistics topics more than the FEP topics um, because the audience might be less familiar with the kind of um, syntactic theory. So to begin with, natural language syntax yields what linguists um, call an unbounded array of hierarchically structured expressions. Unbounded meaning that they can potentially go on forever. There's no upper bound on the limit of uh, a sentence length, right? You can always make any sentence longer by simply adding John said that at the beginning of it and it gets longer. The only thing that stops sentences going on forever is uh, the you know, working memory, the age of the average human being and indeed the age of the universe, you know, sentences can't just go on forever. They have to stop at some point. Um, but the generative component in principle could do that. So that's the interesting part about language, the fact that you can in principle generate an unbounded array of, of expressions. So I, I kind of argued in this paper that these are used in the surface of active inference, which is in turn in accord with the free energy principle. So the general goal is to kind of align certain concerns of linguistics with those of the normative model for organic system behavior associated with the FEP. So I'm going to be relying on theoretical linguistics with special emphasis on syntax, which is uh, the system that, will, that determines the kind of order that words um, go in, the uh, structure and organization in, uh, relation, the organizational relations between words and sentences. So a lot of these design principles are kind of um, general to the biological component of language, not just for specific instantiations of language. Um, so they're not specific to English or French or Swahili, they're kind of general design principles um, about how um, the language system seems to be like organized. Uh, so like I said, I want to kind of emphasis, emphasize more uh, on the linguistics um, uh, topic more than active inference, just for the purposes of like, exposition. Uh, although the, the preprint itself has all the kind of relevant details if, if you're interested in reading more. But um, yeah, but kind of the, the brief historical background here is that since around the turn of the century, about 20, 25 years ago, linguists have basically been um, developing theories of linguistic computation uh, which invoke economy principles. So um, basically the idea is that when you pass and construct a sentence, there are certain computations that enter into that process. Uh, it's not just a single kind of chunk that you memorize or produce, you do it in discrete uh, uh, operations. And yet for some reason, there's currently no means of grounding or motivating these ideas through more general non-linguistic domains. So recently proposed principles of economy um, such as minimal search or least ever criteria, which I'll explain and give you definitions of soon. And um, I, I argue that they adhere to the FEP. And if this can be shown, then this permits a greater degree of explanatory power to the FEP with respect to higher language functions. And it also presents a language with a first principle grounding of notions pertaining to computability and so on. So in other words, the, the idea is this, um, natural language syntax is a system, it's an organic system, it's a formal system, it can, it can be described using the, the language of uh, uh, theory of recursive functions and computability imported from computer science and, and, and all the rest of it. But there's a problem. And um, all of these principles of economy and language design in the literature are unsurprisingly kind of language focused, right? They're, they have a very kind of linguistically um, encoded 
uh, background. Um, and so uh, there's a bit of a paradox because one of the original goals of this program was actually to see, okay, let's see how much of language is actually uh, uh, can arise through the kinds of formal principles that govern the organizing uh, shape of you know, snowflakes or, or the morphology of lightning bolts and so on. Kind of just general um, uh, domain, general uh, laws of nature, essentially, that can give rise in different ways across different domains. Um, and yet the linguistic the linguistic literature is still kind of uh, encoding these in, in language specific terms rather than relating them to more general principles of brain organization or mental computation. So that's the kind of background. Um, so many historical insights into syntax, I argue, are kind of consistent with the FEP, which provides a novel perspective under which the principles governing syntax are not limited to language, but they actually reflect domain general processes that underpin a variety of cognitive computations. This is also consistent with a strain within theoretical linguistics that explores how syntactic computation may adhere to general principles that may well fall within extra biological natural law, in particular considerations of minimal computation, such that certain linguistic theories might be engaging with general properties of organic systems that impact language design. So I think that's kind of a beautiful idea, the idea that um, all the, you know, the language that we speak, English, French, German, not only are they biologically grounded, but actually the rules that kind of govern the uh, what you can say, what you can't say, uh, and, and, and indeed how you how your brain computes and parses sentences, part of that process you kind of get for free if you just assume um, an extra biological natural law, one of which you can you can argue is is the French principle. So that's the kind of background here. So um, the structuring influence of, F, of the FP can be detected in language. Um, not only has been argued recently at the complex level, so the, um, Carl Christen and his colleagues have published a bunch of papers in the last year or two, mainly in 2020, arguing that um, active inference can relate to uh, narrative comprehension, interpersonal dialogue, like when two people talk, um, cooperative intentional communication, uh, and speech segmentation. Um, but I'm going to kind of argue that all of these things rely on something uh, much more lower down, and that's syntax. If you can't um, syntactically construct a phrase, if you can't put two words together and form a phrase, you're not going to get very far, right? You at least need to do that in order to engage in, um, you know, intentional uh, cooperation and, and narrative and, and uh, storytelling and speech segmentation. You at least need to be able to form a phrase, right? If you can't do that, you can't do anything to do with language. So I'm, I'm kind of arguing that, um, you know, uh, all, of the, all of the ways that the FEP can be related to all of these things here is arises from a more kind of fundamental lower level consideration to do with the way that um, uh, phrase level computations are executed. Hey, Elliot, so hope... uh, um, have you changed any slides? We can't see any slides changing. Just okay. Uh, yeah, I have changed a few slides. Yeah, just maybe unshare and reshare. But okay, it stands alone what you've said as well. But it will be also good to have the visual. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, okay. How about this? So we see your mouse and then just advance like on the left bar, like click onto your next slide. Mm -hmm. Yep. Perfect. Okay. What about now? No. Okay. Oh, I see. My bad. My bad. Okay. Um, well, I might have to. Hmm. Like window in focus? Oops. Yeah. This just as a non linguist was really interesting that you appeal to like kind of bigger laws than linguistics, mm -hmm. like complex systems theory or snowflakes and lightnings, like you said, and then yeah. just pointing out that you're kind of bringing linguistic level rules or patterns into a bigger scope. Okay, cool. So we see it with the Chomsky now. Perfect, perfect. Okay, well, um, I've only skipped like five slides, so everything that I've just said is so yeah i showed the the paper here's the paper and um, i simply regurgitated this i emphasized this all of these things i've already read out so yeah if you heard what i said then that's good great okay so can you see slide number eight yep cool awesome okay uh okay so um if the process of constructing hierarchically organized sets of linguistic features into words and phrases and sentences can be shown to adhere to principles of efficient computation and this process must also operate within certain fundamental constraints on neural dynamics, such as those implied by the FEP, through which the homeostatic brain minimizes the dispersion of intraseptic and extraseptic states. The FEP can also allow us to understand how natural language complies with the constraints imposed on worldly interactions, deriving certain features of language from first principles. So again, at the moment, this is all this is all pretty abstract. 
Um, I'm going to give you some much more like concrete examples. So I apologize if it's a little bit philosophical at the moment. Um, so a number of robust findings from theoretical linguistics can be used to support the image of the brain as a constructive organ, assembling and inferring linguistic representations in the surface of surprise, minimization, and related goals. So syntactic structures are not mind external entities. Uh, they're not the kind of thing that a physicist could easily examine, but they're rather actively inferred by the brain. Uh, seemingly with the help of endogenous low frequency activity, coordinating cross-cortical gamma atomization of linguistic features, according to a bunch of recent models of neurolinguistics, which I'm going to get back to at the end. Um, so in other words, we have a general framework for how syntax is implemented at the abstract level, and we also maybe have a kind of a decent understanding of how that's implemented in the brain. So that's the kind of the long vision of this presentation. At the end, we're going to, I'm going to try and wrap it all up by returning to the brain. Um, but for now, uh, I'll give you a more kind of concrete example. So I said that syntactic structures are, have to be inferred, that they're a form of inference. They're, they're uh, inference generation, they're not just um, passive um, perception. So um, if you have a structure like, we watched a movie with Jim Carrey, that can mean two things. Um, it can either mean um, the movie stars Jim Carrey, uh, the Truman Show say, we watched the Truman Show, or you actually watch the movie whilst um, sat next to, to Jim Carrey. Uh, it depends on how you pass it, right? It depends on um, how, which phrases get merged with um, in, in, in which order, basically. Uh, so there's a kind of general rough uh, schematic here um, that you can kind of find an elaboration of in, in, in the preprint paper that I mentioned. But the basic idea is that there's structural ambiguity that arises from syntax. So therefore, the whole process of syntax has to be an inference process. It's not given to us uh, on, a, on a spoon. We have to kind of, we have to do some homework in order to construct every possible pass. So that poses the problem, how does the brain do that? Um, it is an inferential process. So what are the operations involved in that? So here's a, a kind of a, a standard, what, what are called tree structures in linguistics. There's, there's two different ways of passing the sentence. Um, you can either shoot an elephant who's wearing your pajamas, which is definitely possible, or you can shoot an elephant whilst wearing your pajamas. And it depends how you, uh, in which order you merge the phrases, right? In which, which hierarchical relationship is exhibited, if that makes sense. So uh, there's kind of a lot of theoretical background here in linguistics that I won't go into because that's a whole other, you know, a whole, whole different lecture. Um, but the, the basic idea is that there's an ambiguity in structure generation. It's not always, uh, language is not um, a system of beads on a string, it's a, it's a structure. So along, along that kind of theme, I'm also assuming a distinction in linguistics between what's called I language and E language. And this is a really crucial distinction to get clear, so I want to make sure that um, this, this makes sense to, to everybody. So an I language is um, the, the actual internal knowledge that an individual human being has in their mind brain. Uh, I stands to individual, internal, and intentional. Intentional with an S meaning meaning, that literally means meaning, generating meanings. On the other hand, you have um, what are called the E language perspective, and that is actually uh, arguably not really uh, formidable or coherent. It's the idea that language is a kind of external um, a system, a mind external, an extra mental system. Uh, like the English language is somehow out there in the world, and, and when we learn the English language, we kind of approximate some kind of mind external system. And we all have something in common, i.e. we all approximate to the English language in different ways. But the I-language perspective assumes that when we actually communicate with each other, um, the reason why we can successfully communicate is not because we share an E-language in common, it's because our I-languages successfully um, sufficiently overlap to the degree that we can actually communicate successfully. So every, everybody's I-language is different. It's often said that there's you know, 7,000 languages on the planet, but that's obviously not, not true. There's actually you know, however many people there are on the planet, I can't remember, it's like 7 billion or something like that, seven and a half. And that's how many languages there are. Uh, every human being has a different language faculty. And it's set, the parameters are set differently. We all have different um, idiolects, different understandings and so on. And that kind of sounds really obvious, right? When you think about it, it's like, obviously that's true. But um, the implications for the study of language are actually pretty uh, kind of impactful. In other words, when we study um, linguistic competence, we are studying like a mind internal computational system. And um, we're not studying something outside so the English language is not something that linguists actually study. We don't know. That's not a coherent concept. Uh, it's like the concept of culture or um, community or whatever. It's, th these are not things that physicists could, you know, identify. Um, that's not to say that we can't say things about them. You know, we can abstract. The, the human mind can construct theories of, of e-languages, I guess. You know, you can talk about the English language you know, changing over the decades, which is you know, kind of definitely coherent way to talk about language, and you can study it in that way. But from a naturalistic perspective, from a biological perspective, that's no use. Right? The only way we can study it is based on uh, what an individual mind brain is doing. So to give another example here, um, uh, if you take a recent film that uh, IGN released a trailer for yesterday, 
hitman's wife's bodyguard. Um, the defining property of language is said to be this unbounded array of hierarchical organized expressions via recursion. So recursion is the defining property of natural language syntax, but it turns out to be distributed unevenly across the world's languages. So some people have argued that certain languages don't exhibit um, recursion at all, um, but this actually tells us nothing about the actual biological language. So in other words, speakers of these languages can easily learn Portuguese, right? So the idea is that um, language can easily and readily be exhibited by most of the world's languages. Again, when I say world's languages, I mean a kind of convenient description of uh, every individual's uh, fixed uh, language faculty. So most Germanic languages only allow a single pronominal um, genitive limited to proper nouns. So German doesn't allow recursive embedding of possessives. So in German, you can say John's house, but you can't say John's sister's friend's house. Uh, so the above movie, when it's released in Germany, I assume it's going to have to be called something like the bodyguard of Hitman's wife, which has a slightly different tone to it. So the idea is that um, this fundamental capacity of language to execute recursion, and um, you can find it all over the place. You can find it in uh, phrase embedding, center embedding phrases, the way that we actually construct phrases, or you can find it in, in other ways, like in this example here. So um, relating this back to the FEP, while the FEP is a variational principle of least action, such as those that describe systems with conserved quantities, a relatively recent program in linguistics has suggested that natural language syntax adheres to principles of least action and minimal search. So modern theoretical linguistics remains comparatively remote from other fields in cognitive science, uh, but certain postulates from this field resonate with the FEP and its literature. So uh, many biological and cognitive principles of efficiency might be special cases of a variational principle of free energy. Pursuing this assessment should allow researchers from distinct disciplines to reevaluate their hypotheses and empirical evidence in terms of lower level free energy, which is the kind of goal that I, I have in mind here. But we should also stress, as a recent paper does, that the FAP can be used as a methodological heuristic for research. Um, but it's not a theory of everything, it's just a framework. And actually, I find this very similar to a, um, a, a framework in linguistics called the Minimalist Program, which is a program. It's not a coherent, not yet at least, uh, it has a couple of theories, working theories, but it's not a coherent body of doctrine at the moment. It's an ongoing research program with a particular ideology and framework, and that's exactly what the, what the FAP is, right? It's a formal principle um, which yields uh, and can uh, contribute to a discrete individual and separate um, sub-theories, depending on what domain you're looking at. Um, so uh, I kind of like the idea. They're both programmatic notions, uh, and, that, and you can implement them in different ways. So, uh, so we'll be working here with the FAP, um, the paper in question doesn't work on the FEP so much. It's an, it's an applied approach to the FEP. Um, so the FEP has been argued to be more of a kind of conceptual mathematical model for self-organized systems. Um, and as a recent review by Andrews makes clear, there's a number of ways that the FEP has served as an aid to scientific work without constituting like falsifiable assertions about the state of nature. It's a, it's a program. It's, it's a way of uh, usefully describing uh, certain uh, joints of nature without necessarily carving them. So while we argue that natural language syntax, um, so when we argue that natural language syntax complies with the free energy principle, I'm not necessarily implying that the FAP you know, necessarily bears specific direct predictions from linguistic behavior. It's rather a way of motivating the construction of novel, novel conceptual arguments for how some property of organic systems might be seen as realizing the goals of the FAP. So as I said, uh, repeating the I language, E language distinction, I'm focusing on knowledge which is internal to the mind of the speaker. Uh, exploring their apparent competence rather than you know what they happen to produce. So one example that you can think of it immediately is the existence of syntactic structures can contribute to a unique form of epistemic foraging through maximizing model evidence and minimizing surprise and variation of free energy. The actual paper in question that I'm, I'm citing here kind of goes into more detail, but the basic idea is that the highly restricted uh, set of syntactic projections, what I call um, the way that you can uh, categorize a phrase and nouns and verbs and, and complementizer phrases and so on. That restricted set, that finite set of ways that you can define a particular phrase as being a verb phrase or a noun phrase um, achieves that goal. So you can also assume that languages, um, language users during comprehension select the phrase structure that's least surprising from the perspective of the hierarchical gender model. Again, this goes back to the, um, we watched a movie with Jim Carrey example. It's uh, prediction and uh, 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 plays a pretty big role here. So as such, phrase structure building can be cast as an internal action. It's an actual internal action that an individual does in the sense of the active inference framework that selects among competing hypotheses, i.e. syntactic structures. You can parse it this way, you can parse it another way. Uh, and also the same goes for lexical semantics, not just syntax. Um, in other words, you can, you can you know, interpret an individual way one way or the other. And I'm going to give some examples later. 
So pretty much all of language from individual words up to sentences um, uh, are inference generated. And also a little side point here, um, relating more directly to existing work on active inference and communication. Um, it's, I think it's pretty interesting to note that the recursive combinatorial apparatus of syntax has been argued to facilitate recursive theory of mind, right? So the ability, your, your ability to know that someone else knows, that she knows, that you know this and so on. Um, and it could be seen therefore as deriving or piggybacking in some way um, active inference based properties of higher order linguistic communication, um, which in turn serves to unveil the latent or hidden states that are other people's mental states, which is the kind of standard assumption in um, theory of mind active inference uh, research. But I think it can be related much more directly to, to language once we understand that the extended kind of uh, 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 use of, of theory of mind in language is, it comes directly from this recursive property, right? Okay, so I'm now gonna move on to uh, kind of the more concrete examples. Everything I've said so far is pretty philosophical and pretty abstract, but I wanna kind of give you some actual concrete examples here so it kind of makes a bit more sense. So free energy provides additional constraints on what a computational system can be physically realized as, which is very useful. So take the first uh, three principles in classical recursive function theory, which allow functions to compose. Substitution, primitive recursion, and uh, minimization. These are all designed in a way that you might think of as computationally efficient. They reuse the output of earlier computations. Uh, so for instance, substitution replaces the argument of function with another function. Primitive recursion defines a new function on the basis of a recursive call to itself, bottoming out in a pre previously defined function. And minimization produces the output of a function with the smallest number of possible steps. So the notion of minimizing surprise can be used to ground observations from theoretical linguistics pertaining to the grammar's propensity to reduce the search space during syntactic derivations, permit no tampering of objects during syntactic derivations, so it restricts the number of resources able to be combined in, in a given moment. So in other words, this is very uh, kind of an abstract example, but I'm gonna give you some more concrete ones soon. Uh, during any particular part of a sentence, you don't just uh, search the lexicon and extract a new unit just because you can, you only do so if you need to. If the current um, number of lexical items that you've already searched the lexicon for um, suffice to generate a given interpretation, then you don't need to, uh, search for more items, that, that's sufficient, right? So in other words, don't just do, don't do more search when less search is possible. Uh, and also relates to the grammar propensity to limit the range of representation of resources able to be called upon during any given stage of comprehension. So examining some core principles of occasion, natural language clearly exhibits minimization, right? Uh, while binary branching of structures limits redundant computation. So binary branching uh, calls back to that slide I showed a few minutes ago where you have these uh, binary branching tree structures so I shot an elephant in, in my pajamas, and um, that all uh, uh, relates to, that, that can all be derived through successive implementations of a binary branching operation. That simply puts two things together and gives it a certain identity. So natural language syntax also exhibits discrete units, obviously, there's individual words, uh, which leads to a discreteness continuity duality. So syntax is driven by closeness of computation, so objects X and Y form a distinct object, X and Y, its objects are also bounded, so there's, there's a fixed list. So there's nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, convertizers, uh, tense objects, uh, little nouns and little verbs, aspectual elements, and so on. All these different particular functional and content-related notions. Their hierarchical ordering is based on a specific functional sequence as well, um, which imposes direct restrictions on combinatorics. These objects can be combined into cycles, so recursive embedding, which can be extended to form non-local dependencies. So an example of that is you have like number um, plurality marking. So you can say the keys to the old wooden cabinet are on the table, uh, not the keys to the old wooden cabinet is on the table. Because obviously is goes with keys, they, they have to mark for, they have to agree in the number feature, right? So that's an example where you have a non-local um, dependency between two elements. So you have to hold it in memory, uh, even though they cross phrase boundaries. So syntax still keeps on uh, generating new structures but you have to associate one element with a new element further down the road. Um, so these properties are in turn guided by principles of minimal search and least effort, which I'll show in a minute, fulfilling the goal of active inference to construct meaningful representations as efficiently as possible. And I think that's really what it, what it comes down to. That's the kind of core crucial message here. Um, if it can be shown that the, the language system uh, constructs meaningful representations as efficiently as possible, then therefore it, should, it must be in accord uh, with the FEP. And again, that contributes to surprise minimization amongst other goals. So from the perspective of FEP, um, the range of possible 
structures available to comprehenders provide alternative hypotheses that generalize and as such preclude overfitting sensory data. So if the complexities of linguistic stimuli can be efficiently mapped to a small series of regular and regularized in the sense of learned syntactic formats, this contributes to the brain's more general goal of restricting itself to a limited number of characteristic states. So in other words, only change your belief about things if you have to, right? And by mapping syntactic structures to language external conceptual interfaces, now that's a kind of a key term, language external interfaces, what that means is you have a, a narrow um, uh, component of language, the kind of narrow, what's called the narrow faculty of language, but you can call it whatever you like. It's just the capacity to, to construct phrase structures. But then you have language external mental modules, you know, memory systems, uh, and what have you, um, attentional control systems uh, in the mind that are located across different cortical surfaces. You know, it's, it's the kind of the standard, the standard modular framework, I guess. Um, so by mapping these structures that have, that have been generated by language to these language external interfaces, in a manner adhering to principles of economy, language can be seen as engaging in a series of questions and answers with sensory data and non-specific. So the recent work in theoretical semantics assumes that there are um, there are fetchable concepts that language can um, interface with, and there are also non-fetchable concepts. So in other words, that there are systems, there, there are properties of human thought that the language uh, system seems pretty keen on, um, and it likes to use and exploit quite a lot. But there are other uh, modules of cognition that for some reason um, can't be linguistically encoded as easily. That's kind of a weird property, right? Like why should we able why should we be able to linguistically encode and communicate about certain thoughts but not others? Um, so one example is many of the world's languages, again, when I say world's languages, I mean that in quotation marks. Uh, what I really mean is many of the individual human beings, you know, languages, they make use of quantification or numerosity often, you know, typically seen as via this frontal parietal uh, uh, quantification network, which is interestingly closely linked uh, uh, to major language sites. So that might be one of the reasons why it makes use of it. Um, but they make little use of color, uh, despite color featuring just as prominently in ordinary experience, right? Our sensorium is filled with colors. Um, and this might be due to the remoteness of occipital visual regions in the brain. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, that's one explanation. Maybe it's wrong. But it's one possible reason. So, for instance, one might imagine some functional morphine um, encoding brightness or shade of coloration in language. You can imagine, it, like, if you were to invent a new language, you could you could encode color uh, features somehow as some kind of inflectional morphine. But that doesn't seem to be the case, even though, like I said, color is a pretty important part of ordinary life. At the same time, language seems to make considerable use of certain contemplative concepts like evidentiality, but not others like worry. If you're like you know, no morphemes mark how concerned somebody is about something. I'm very concerned, I'm a little bit concerned, I'm not very concerned. Uh, which seems to be making potentially neurally efficient use of specific, access easily accessible representational resources rather than less easily accessible cognitive modules, right? To map complex meaning uh, onto natural language expressions. So it's fair to observe that language acts as an artificial context which helps constrain what representations are recruited and what impact they have on reasoning and inference. So words themselves are highly flexible and metabolically cheap sources of prize throughout the neural hierarchy. This is a really cool idea that I'm going to expand on uh, in a few minutes of time. So to give you some more examples of, again, relating this back to active inference, um, take the second, ball, second blue ball to the left of the large box. That's a pretty simple spatial direction, but it can only be encoded via natural language syntax. Right? You need that kind of hierarchically organized phrase structure to generate that particular thought. It's a very simple thought, very simple direction, but you can only generate inferences about it through using the recursive um, combinatorial operative language. Similarly, you have structures like the young, happy, eager, either going to Oxford or Cambridge, pleasant man. This involves unbounded, unstructured coordination involving disjunction too. So the disjunction is you know, X or Y, uh, which is a highly complex structure to compute. It's a highly complex conceptual structure and yet language users can easily do it and readily infer it. But it also um, opens the, the door for a whole new species of inferences to be generated, new thoughts about the world, new possible hidden states, new things that you can think about. And um, one of the examples of that Jerry Fodo, the philosopher used to give is, um, uh, he said, you know, if you take a, a, a pen and a piece of paper, you can easily draw a man, you can easily draw a zebra, but it's kind of difficult to draw the thought that there is not a zebra next to you, right? So if you try and conceptualize the thought, there is not a zebra next to me, how can you draw that? How can you depict the fact that there is no zebra next to me? That's kind of weird, it's kind of difficult to do. I suppose you could draw like 
a man and then a zebra and a line through the zebra. But that's kind of weird. That still presupposes that there's a zebra next to him that you reject. Um, so language uh, generates a whole new species of, a new format for thought, basically. It generates a new format for thought, um, which seems to be unique. In other words, not readily um, translatable into other uh, domains like visual representation and so on. So these rapid inferences of our properties and states, hidden states, can be generated relatively effortlessly by language. And like I said, no other computational system in human cognition uh, can achieve this. Well, that's the idea. Anyway. So a number of economy principles have been proposed in, in theoretical linguistics. These are all very, you know, kind of technical um, syntax related notions. So I'm not going to explain too many of them, but I will give some examples. Um, these have all been framed, like I said at the beginning, they've all been framed exclusively within a linguistic context, invoking highly domain specific notions, despite a core part of the intended project of modern theoretical linguistics being to embed linguistic theory within principles general to cognition, right? So for example, the inclusiveness condition maintains that no new elements can be introduced in the course of a particular syntactic derivation. So once you're, in other words, once you're parsing a particular sentence and you're deriving a particular um, representation of that, you're not just going to randomly introduce a new lexical item or a new um, hidden element, just, just for the sake of it. You're only going to do it if it contributes to immediate interpretation. Um, and so only existing elements can be rearranged, restricting available resources. But it's also unclear to what extent this computational principle finds analogous examples in non-linguistic domains, right? So one way of motivating these language-specific um, generalizations by making direct reference to the FAP will not only foster, I think, uh, more fruitful relationships between uh, theories of power cognition and neurobiology, but will also broaden the explanatory scope for the existence and prevalence of particular syntactic phenomena. Um, but what's interesting to note is that linguists readily admit they're lacking a specific theory of computational efficiency for language. Like I said at the beginning, it's kind of a program, right? It's a programmatic notion. So in a recent paper, Galeo and Chomsky uh, point out, to be sure, we do not have a general theory of computational efficiency, but we do have some observations that are pretty obvious and should be part of that theory, right? That's basically the state of the field. Uh, linguists have very um, uh, well uh, honed theories of uh, language-specific uh, efficient uh, efficiency uh, uh, criteria. But uh, translating that into kind of more domain general uh, goal uh, areas has, has not been so successful. But we can at least suppose that whatever definition will be forthcoming will be related to more generic notions of economy, like Hamiltonian notions, uh, or minimizing energy expenditure during language processing, uh, shortening the description length, you know, minimal description length, uh, reducing polymer complexity, and the degree of necessitated belief updating. Again, like I said, you know, revise one's belief if, if needed, uh, and what have you. So one of these uh, so-called uh, minimal computational procedures is uh, what's called relativized minimality. So this is the principle that states that given a particular configuration, x, z, and y, uh, a local relation cannot connect x and y if z intervenes and z fully matches the specification of x and y in terms of the relevant features. I'll give an example of that. So in other words, if X and Y attempt to establish a syntactic relation, if you go, if you call back to the long distance dependency thing I mentioned, um, but some element intervenes and provide and can also provide a superset of X's particular features, i.e. X's features plus some other features, this blocks the relation. That sounds extremely abstract, so I do apologize for that, but this is uh, a more concrete example. So in the sentence you have in one, um, which game provides a superset of the uh, uh, features um, hosted by how? which results in unacceptability. But the equivalent does not obtain in two, and so a relationship between both copies of which game can obtain, licensing interpretation. Uh, and the strike through denotes the originally merged position after, uh, after movement has taken place. So it's originally merged down here, and then you move the structure to the beginning of the sentence in order in, uh, to form a question. So question formation often uh, involves just moving one element uh, in the middle of the end of the sentence to the beginning to form a question. And um, so if you say, how do you wonder which game to play? That sounds pretty ungrammatical. But if you say, which game do you wonder how to play, which has the same approximate interpretation, that's OK. Um, and the reason why is because uh, 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 how hosts only a queue feature, a question feature. And then as it searches down the structure, um, it, it encounters which game. Now, which game bears a queue feature because of which, but it also has a noun feature because of game. And so therefore, it can't reach its final destination, the final destination being its originally merged position after play, which only has a queue feature. On the other hand, if you move uh, which game to a book do you wonder, and you leave how in situ, then which game carries these two features here, and it skips over how. 
because how doesn't does not satisfy the full feature specifications of which game, right? So it needs to search further, and then only when it uh, searches back and reaches to its originally merged position does it interpret it. So this mean what this means is when you say which game do you wonder how to play, you're interpreting which game at the position of play, because you're not inter you're not interpreting it at the position of wonder. You're not asking which game do you wonder how you wonder. You're asking which game do you wonder how you play. It's all about the, the question is about uh, the play on it. Um, so this has been argued to emerge directly from minimal search, uh, allowing this higher level representational principle to emerge directly from properties of efficient computation. This is one example where you have a kind of uh, a rhetorically kind of gross, uh, uh, higher order uh, uh, principle in, in linguistics being uh, reduced to a lower level and more simple kind of element. So translating that into minimal search, you can, you can consider, as I just said, when you search the structure for matching your features in two, the minimal search procedure would simply skip how, but it'll find the original copy of which game because it's searching in, a, in a, across the, the, the full structure. So another example of economy can be found in the principle of full interpretation, which simply states um, that there are no superfluous symbols allowed at the two linguistic interfaces. So these interfaces are assumed to be the conceptual and central motor systems. So in other words, the two things you can do with a linguistic structure is you can interpret it or you can externalize it. You can produce it, you can, you can say it, you can sign it, uh, you can translate it into Braille and so on, um, or you can simply think it. So this ensures that the system need not compute symbols that are ultimately superfluous to the goals of either interpretation or externalization. So for instance, in three, this has an argument that does not have a semantic role, so therefore it's unacceptable. So you can imagine um, the sentence, Walt gave Jesse a gun, that's fine. All the semantic roles are, are filled. There's the agent, there's a patient, and there's an instrument being involved, a particular tool. But then if you add to saw, there's an additional kind of location preposition uh, being marked there, but it doesn't have a semantic role, so it can't be interpreted. And that sounds kind of trivial, right? Like most people, when you, when you give them these examples, they say, well, yeah, obviously, that's kind of not a very deep thing. But actually, it's a, it's a pretty puzzling like phenomenon. If, if it demands explanation, it has to be explained somehow. Um, so one of the operations that's been involved in this uh, uh, minimal computational uh, procedure is called merge. So the operation merge simply uh, takes x and y and forms the set x, y. It just puts two things together. Um, and this constructs the, the binary branching structures that I mentioned. But merge itself can also derive some core uh, set theoretic properties of linguistic relations, such as membership, uh, dominate, term of, and so on, these different hierarchical relations between nodes in, in, in a tree. Uh, you know, one, one uh, branch of a tree being higher up or more deeply embedded than another one, um, as well as other relations, what's called C command, we can put that aside. Um, so in brief, much of the complexities of syntactic relations um, can be derived from successive instances of this simple merge computation. Uh, reducing complex visibles to simple invisibles. So, for instance, if you the example I gave uh, here with which game, um, you can imagine uh, the set A B being constructed, and then if you take the same element B and you merge it with the set again, you get B A B, and then you can delete the first appearance of B, and then you simply get the linear order would be B A, right, rather than the actual set being interpreted B A B, and this seems to be what's happening here where you have a B over here, which game, and then an A, the full structure, and then B again, uh, being originally merged. So all of these kind of com superficially complex linguistic phenomena, which on the surface seem very complicated and very elaborate, they can all be boiled down to a very simple operation, which is just take two things and put them together. Uh, and that, what's interesting about this is that related phenomena like a junction uh, do not involve modification of the semantic content of the structure the adjunct is concatenated with, so an adjunct is something like uh, like a prepositional um, object, like in the park or to the beach. And uh, so, for instance, if you take a structure like John and Mary talked in the park, the fact that they talked in the park doesn't change the fact that they talk, right? So the actual original interpretation, the syntactic structure of the integrity and the meaning of John and Mary talk is not changed by adding an adjunct. So you can add an adjunct in the park, but that doesn't change the fact that John and Mary still talk, right? Again, that sounds like a very trivial property, obvious, right? But again, it demands explanation. There has to be a reason for that. Um, and the reason why is it turns out that um, when you add an adjunct, you simply um, concatenate. You simply linearly add it to the end. You don't change the actual um, identity of the phrase itself. Uh, there's no what's called labeling. There's no labeling involved in prepositional merging. So you don't change the identity of the, of the phrase. So the FEP has been equated with uh, the principle of least effort. 
um, and its process theory is after inference. So strictly speaking, the FPP basically is a computational principle, right? Uh, the probabilistic beliefs it's concerned with are directed at something, namely external states of a self-organizing system. And in, in a similar way that the FPP is a research heuristic, so too is much of recent theoretical linguistics guided by programmatic concerns, right? Like I said, it's a program, it's an ongoing kind of ideology. On the other hand, linguists have developed theories of syntactic least effort, like I said, um, but the process theory is a little bit less clear, right? How it's actually implemented uh, is, is slightly less clear, um, but I would argue may become more clear if it can be accommodated within existing frameworks and knowledge that the active inference framework can bring with it to help solve the puzzle of how uh, language is uh, uh, implemented in the brain. So here's another example for you. Uh, routinely, poems that rhyme evaporate. So in this instance, routinely exclusively modifies evaporate. So the word routinely goes with evaporate, that's how they're interpreted. So it cannot modify rhyme, even though this word is closer in terms of linear distance to routinely, right? So rhyme comes one, two, three words after, but evaporate comes one, two, three, four in terms of linear distance. So they're more, they're more linearly remote, um, and yet in, in terms of interpretation, they go together. Uh, and the reason is uh, the matrix predicate evaporate is closer in terms of structural distance to routinely. And the reason why is um, that rhyme is embedded within the phrase headed by poems. So it, has a, it's on a, it exists on a different hierarchical plane, if you like. It's kind of lower down in the hierarchy than evaporate. Um, so language computes over structural distance and not linear distance. So sentences are not simply beads on a string. They're not uh, linear objects. Um, they have to be linear objects in terms of centrimotor externalization because we live in the universe we live in. Uh, we, can't, we can't speak in parallel, we can only speak in uh, linear uh, uh, linearization. Although there is some evidence that uh, sign languages uh, can communicate some, uh, to some degree in parallel. Like you sign one uh, element with one hand and then another with another hand. So there's some evidence that sign language might be able to uh, uh, defy the laws of physics, but it turns out it's, that's probably exaggerated to an extent. It's, um, it is still a form of linearization, but just kind of uh, co-linearization of different elements. Um, so language prioritizes the demands of the syntax semantics interface over other subsystems like morphophonology. So while two structures might exhibit different linear orders, they may exhibit the same underlying hierarchical order. So here's a really good example in English and Basque. The verb direct object dependencies are the opposite, but the interpretation is conserved. So John has read the book. You have John, then auxiliary, then the verb, then the object. And um, in Basque, you have a different order. You have John, then the book, then the verb, and then the auxiliary. And yet they mean the same thing. They have the same interpretation, right? So this suggests that um, a kind of more fundamental uh, operation is going on here. Namely, syntax encodes the verb and direct object as an abstract phrase, which omits the subject. So in other words, in the syntax, in English and Basque, you have the same underlying syntax, which is subject and then verb and direct object being merged first. So you merge the V and DO first, and then you accommodate the subject. And then when you linearize that, when you, you know, communicate it in the, externally, um, you do it in different ways. In English, you do it one way. In Basque, you do it another way. Um, but the basic idea is the same. You have the same underlying interpretation. That also accounts for something pretty obvious, namely the fact that you can translate, you know, one sentence into another language, right? That's, that's, that's a fairly obvious thing that you can do with language. Um, and so therefore, there has to be some kind of commonality somehow. But the commonalities might be uh, much more deeper down than, than most people kind of appreciate. So through the various stages of, of language development as well, infants and children don't typically produce expressions that deviate from general grammatical principles pertaining to the structure dependence of, of rules, even when they produce so-called mistakes. So there's been a lot of research on uh, uh, child language development. That that's looking. So in other words, when children do make mistakes, they seem to make mistakes which accord with the grammatical rules of their language, which suggests that um, sensitivity to um, structure dependence uh, forms a core part of language design. So corpus studies of infant language exposure reveal that there are actually very few biograms, let alone trigrams. So statistical procedures can help, but there seems to be some more kind of innate sensitivity to structure dependence, um, which seems necessary. And as a recent paper also reviews, human learners prefer to induce hypotheses that have a shorter description length than logic, with simplicity preferences possibly being a, uh, a governing principle uh, of uh, cognitive systems, all in accord with what the FAP would, would predict. So simplicity-based preferences anchor a range of formal language models too, relating to the notion of minimal description length, and you, know, you might also invoke uh, principles of minimal redundancy and so on. 
So this is a kind of a really important idea. Uh, uh, minimal computational efficiency seems to be a really general cognitive goal of the brain. And there's a couple of recent papers, one of them in ticks, I think that came out uh, maybe last year or, or maybe this year, I can't remember. Um, I think it was called memory as a computational resource, which showed that um, across a bunch of domains, human memory in its various guises also exhibits uh, an adherence to principles of efficiency. So I think it's not too surprising to uh, when linguists come along and say, you know, language also adheres to principles of efficient computation. So all of these ideas seem to be, you know, out there at the moment. Um, everyone's kind of coming to more or less the same conclusions, but it's just using different language, just using different background assumptions. But the general idea, I think, is is kind of uh, they all mesh well together. So as I said, linguistic computation seems to be optimized for the generation of interpretable structures rather than for the generation of maximally communicative messages to conspecifics. So in other words, um, whenever there's a conflict between principles of computational efficiency on the one hand and principles of communicative clarity on the other, the former typically wins. Now, this is not to say that when we do communicate with each other, as we're by Tristan and Pippers and, and pointed out, that it's not done efficiently. When we do communicate, we do do it in an efficient way. But that's a separate question from whether or not the language system is designed in a way as to maximize that communication. So the normal functioning of syntax seems to lead to instances which reduce communicative efficiency and prioritize inference generation. So, that, so the goal of the, of the language system is to generate uh, particular inferences and representations about the environment in an efficient way. So here's a pretty clear example of this, right? If you take the sentence, you persuaded Saul to sell his car, the individual and the object can both be questioned, but questioning the more deeply embedded object in terms of the hierarchical structure forces the speaker to produce a more complex circumlocution, right? So you can say, uh, who did you persuade to sell what? But you can't say, what did you persuade who to sell? Even though they mean the same thing, right? Same word, same interpretation. Uh, all it means is, you know, what is the individual and what's the object? That's it. Just just tell me who the, who the individual is and, and what the object is. But you can only say it if you construct it in the most computationally efficient way, i.e. search for the first possible element to question, right? If you search for the more deeply embedded object, can't do it. Um, so the structures in 11 involve the same words, same interpretations, yet the more computationally costly process uh, can't be licensed. So this is a pretty good example, and there's plenty of examples like this, by the way. I've written a paper about it in Glossa. Uh, plenty of examples in which there is a clear conflict between um, syntactic uh, priorities of, of just generating a meaningful structure and generating possible structures that would actually aid communicative efficiency and communicative flexibility. That's not a priority of language. So other examples show that the acceptability of sentences can be impacted based on the extent to which the construction makes an, it contributes to a novel, non-redundant uh, contribution to one's mental model's beliefs. Again, this is really directly in accord with what active inference would predict, uh, rather than those of conspecifics, again, reinforcing the role of syntactic processing and inference generation rather than communication. So the degraded acceptability in 12b, uh, the real, by the way, the reason why these are numbered 12, 13 is because that's, that's, that's the numeration in the, in the paper. So the reason why 12b uh, seems degraded relative to 12a seems to stem from the fact that the speakers are unlikely to be ignorant of the relevant content, right? It's a kind of a pragmatic reason. So Kim knows whether Saul's in bed, that sounds okay. Well, Kim knows whether I'm in bed, sounds kind of weird. Even though it's a technically a grammatical sentence, uh, it sounds weird because you would never say it. It does contribute meaningfully to, to revising or uh, contributing to one's mental models or beliefs about the world. So therefore, the language system doesn't like it, which again, brings in closer contact uh, language design with uh, the FEP. And also cases such as 13 reveal how even processes such as contraction are sensitive to hierarchical structure and can't be executed over any other, any, any random word boundary. So you can say Saul's taller than Kim is, but you can't say Saul's taller than Kim's. Uh, and the reason is because there's a, a invisible phrase boundary between those two elements. Other examples that are related to it are um, in 14 and 15, you can say, what do you want to do? And you can contra contract and say, what do you want to do? But if you say, who do you want to read the book? Uh, you can't contract that to generate, who do you want to read the book? That sounds a bit weird. I mean, you, you technically can say it, right? And, and if you say that to me, I would know what you mean. Uh, I'd know what you mean straight away. There's no problem. But it sounds a bit more awkward. Again, the idea is that there's an invisible phrase boundary there that um, permits, that stops contraction uh, occurring. Uh, efficient computation, uh, or at least structure dependence, I should, I should say, is also exhibited in, in more classical examples in the literature. So if you say the man is happy, you can uh, question that, element, that uh, structure by moving the auxiliary to the front and saying, is the man happy? 
And so you might be forced to conclude, well, maybe to form a question, you simply search the structure and take the first possible uh, element. Um, but that turns out not to be sufficient. So you can say the man who is tall is happy, but you can't say is the man who tall is happy. Uh, because who is tall is, again, similar to poems that rhyme routinely, is embedded more deeply in the, the man-headed phrase that uh, is the, the, the question uh, is happy, which is higher up the hierarchy and easy to search for. So you, therefore you have to say, is the man who is tall happy? Because is is actually closer to the element you're questioning in terms of structural distance than the is in who is tall. So again, syntax cares about structural proximity um, and not linear proximity. And there are also constraints on this as well. Um, so you can say, John ate chicken and bread for lunch. Um, and you can question the whole uh, phrasal conjunct, chicken and bread. You can say, what did John eat for lunch? But if you want to efficiently question one element, let's say you already knew that John ate chicken, but you're not sure what else he ate. You can't say, what did John eat chicken and for lunch? Which, there's no reason why you can't do that, right? Like, why can't you say that? It's a perfectly fine thought. Um, you already know that he ate chicken. You know, someone's just told you he ate chicken and something else. Um, but you can't say, what did John eat chicken and for lunch? Because the whole the syntax respects the integrity of the phrase chicken and bread. It's, it's, it's a, it has a phrasal identity that syntax respects, and you can't violate it. You can't just um, uh, violate the phrase boundary and only interrogate one element of it. Other examples relate across phrase boundaries and conjunct boundaries, not just within them. So you can say, Sam gave a guitar to me and loaned a trumpet to you. And you can question both elements. You can say, what did Sam give to me and loan to you? But you can't say, what did Sam give to me and loan a trumpet to you? Even though, again, in terms of communicative efficiency, that's a pretty simple structure to generate. You already know that he loaned a trumpet to you, but you want to figure out what Sam gave uh, to me, right? Um, and again, these uh, relations of hierarchy, come across, uh, you can find them all over the place. Uh, so pronoun uh, reference is a pretty good example. You can say Mary said that he has a lot of talent and that Peter should go far, in which case the pronoun he is being connected with Peter. Uh, in which case you have the, um, a pronoun he uh, coming before the actual element Peter. But then when you simply take that bare phrase and question it and, and, and state it, it's no longer acceptable. You can't say he has a lot of talent and Peter should go far. That sounds a bit strange. He should refer to someone like John. Um, and the reason why is because when you embed that structure in one, a large structure, it changes the actual identity of the conjunct. So the conjunct that, headed, headed by that, is a complementized phrase. Whereas the, the conjuncts headed by he and Peter are simply tense phrases, TB. Uh, and other puzzles exist here as well. So you can say John, uh, you can say John said he is proud of his house, in which case he goes with John. But it sounds weird to say in John's house he organized a meeting. Uh, and when he refers to John. Again, you can kind of pass it, you can force it, but it sounds a bit more awkward. It's more natural for he to refer to Peter if you say in John's house, you know, someone else Peter organized a meeting. And the reason why is because co-reference via this phenomenal phrase grunting is barred since syntax preserves interpretation across movement. So the original structure that's generated is, uh, John said he's, he's, he's uh, in John's house, he organized a meeting, right? Um, that's, that's generated from a, a more original structure. Uh, he organized a meeting in John's house, in which case you have uh, he uh, coming before John in the same kind of tense phrase structure that I mentioned earlier. So in other words, syntax seems to win over linear precedence. Uh, other kind of quirky examples exist too. So you can say, I gave her the book that Sarah always wanted. But if you say, I gave her the book that Sarah wanted, that, again, that sounds slightly strange. Changing the syntax by adding the adverbial element changes the actual uh, uh, content of the uh, phrase itself, which allows more easier co-reference. So um, stepping back a little bit, this, this whole framework of like merging and generating hierarchical structures has been argued in the literature to kind of uh, boil down from a, a more uh, domain general, lower level uh, computational procedure. So some people have called it the universal generative faculty, which is just the ability to uh, construct hierarchical uh, structures and map them to different interfaces. So the idea is that um, when we have our system of moral uh, judgment formation, which involves agents, patients, events, and so on, that still requires some kind of combinatorial apparatus to, to generate those judgments. Same with music. It's been known since the 70s that um, uh, musical structures have a kind of hierarchical relation to them. And then also with uh, numerosity, with, with numbers, you can imagine that it's been hypothesized by Chomsky that if you restrict this operational merge to a single element and simply reapply it, you can kind of generate the natural numbers, right? So you can kind of form the empty set and then merge it with itself and then merge it with that object and so on. And that kind of gives it, uh, you can call it zero and then call the next one one and call the one after that too. 
that gives them lateral numbers. But the, the general idea is that you have an underlying generative um, faculty that can interface with different subsystems. So when it interfaces with the sound system, you get music. When it interfaces with whatever morality is, theory of minds, structures, or uh, judgment formation, or whatever, you get moral uh, judgments. Uh, when it interfaces with the system of quantification and numerosity, you get the natural numbers. And then when it interfaces with the lexicon, whatever that is, even more mysteriously, you get language, which is exactly what the app I'm, I'm saying right here. Uh, so UGF, major sound, music, and so on. Um, but interestingly, only language seems to attribute to these merged elements an independent identity. So with uh, quantification, music, and morality, you simply involve a generation of, of, of a chunk, some kind of chunking that's happening. But with natural language, you seem to get an additional operation. You don't just chunk things, you chunk them, and then you give it an additional identity, right? You give it a kind of, the, 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 um, the sum is greater than the parts, I guess, you can call it that, that way. So and what's interesting is that you can use that merge structure to then call it again. So the kind of, you can kind of treat it as an independent object, independent of its constituent parts. Whereas you can't, you don't really seem to be able to do that in music or, or language, uh, sorry, uh, non-linguistic domains. So there's also um, a recent paper uh, by Stan Dehane, who argues that this capacity to generate nested tree structures um, is a human-specific kind of a species property, right? And he gives a bunch of different um, neurobiological instantiations of this. Um, but the basic idea is that, you know, only humans have language. Uh, and along, alongside that, you get an interest in a unique level of tool complexity, possibly due to this linguistic capacity. So, for instance, um, spears are constructed from a rock and a shaft. But it's not just a sphere is not just a rock plus a shaft, right? A sphere is a rock plus a shaft with an additional abstraction, the functional use of it, the utility. And I'm going to come back to that in a couple of minutes. But uh, language seems to be uniquely concerned with uh, functional abstractions, like use, not just form. And then on top of that, it seems that only humans have what Chomsky has loosely called the science forming faculty. So only humans are scientists, not surprisingly. Um, we, we can do things like Pearson abduction or non-deductive complex infant generation where you get you know, some weird event E occurs, but then we posit that if A is true, um, then E would simply follow naturally, right? So we assume A. And then, of course, on top of that, we have the other example I mentioned, theory of mind, fostered by hierarchical language. You know, I know that you know that she knows. So there's all these kinds of weird human-specific cognitive traits, all of which can potentially maybe be boiled down to or connected to some linguistic so here's a good example that the hand gives. Um, these are five different types of sequence, sequences that you can generate. Only human beings seem capable of generating nested tree structures, as I've argued here um, and in the paper. Um, we generate tree structures not just randomly. We don't just do it because we feel like it. We do it efficiently and in the it, for the explicit purpose of active input generation. So uh, transition and uh, timing, chunking, ordinal knowledge, algebraic patterns, these are all non-human uh, uh, capacities too. You know, bonobos, macaques, bird song, they all exhibit these forms of things. It's only humans that can do uh, option number five, the nested tree structure business. So again, this is, the, this is the idea that when you merge car factory, you don't just merge two nouns, right? Car and factory. You actually create a noun phrase, a structure that's bigger than the two parts. So in other words, a factory is not a noun phrase and car is not a noun phrase. You need both of them to create a noun phrase. And then you can use that noun phrase as an independent unit um, with its own kind of uh, computational identity. So this leads to a kind of a, a more um, uh, important question, I think, which is what is language? Right? We're, all human beings have language. We all have very strong opinions about what language is. Um, but consider the fact that geometry was originally the study of land measurement right, back in, back in the day, uh, but developed a sufficiently rich body of knowledge to abstract away from original, uh, its original object of, of inquiry and departed also from common sense intuition. So our common sense intuitions about what language is actually have no place in science. Uh, ditto for common sense notions of you know, mass and energy physics. So MIT, uh, Professor Ed Fedorenko recently conducted a Mechanical Turk um, survey, a study, asking ordinary people what they thought language's primary function was. Uh, now, most of them said communication uh, in line with common sense. And she used this, um, this data to criticize the uh, idea from a certain uh, part of linguistics that language isn't basically an instrument of thought. Its primary purpose is to, uh, to contribute to uh, conceptualization. And, but a physicist obviously wouldn't conduct a mechanical uh, Turk survey, randomly asking people what they thought the nature of light is. 
and a biologist wouldn't concern themselves with people's intuitions about how hard to live this way. Um, and so natural language syntax, I think, should be investigated using the same standards of scientific inquiry as any other object in the organic world, right? There's no reason why people's intuitions about language um, should be needed, right? In fact, if that were the case, we'd just, there's no need for linguistic departments. So let's just uh, ask a bunch of random people on the street. Uh, and that's, that's all we need to do. So on top of syntactic phrase generation, um, we can also frame this as contributing to policies uh, used to perform particular free, en free energy minimizing actions and not just generating you know, uh, linguistic objects. So the rapid and reflexive identification of objects, states and events in the, in the external world through simple linguistic means uh, can yield complex, flexible interpretations for some of the most common nominals. Nominals is just a fancy word for nouns. Uh, aiding in the successful generation of internal models of the environment using a limited number of resources. Um, so objects in the world have to be identified and they have to be identified now, immediately, right? In order to be successful in, in, in navigating the world. You have to understand things straight away and uh, rapidly uh, identify things. That's kind of obvious. Um, but that leads to certain puzzles though. So for instance, complex forms of what's called polysemy. Polysemy just means a word having uh, multiple senses. Um, and polysemy also turns out to be much more widespread than most people think it turns out. Um, Almost, I can't remember, I think half the words in the OED are polysemous. Um, complex forms of, I think it was 46% or whatever. Uh, complex forms of polysemy generated via multi word constructions allow for a more precise and exact localization in conceptual space than discrete symbols, signs, and gestures, right? With natural language syntax allowing the generation of a more accurate unveiling of hidden states in the world. So, natural language syntax allows us to more accurately position ourselves in conceptual uh, state space, right? Uh, again, I gave the example of the second blue box to the left, but here's another example for you. You can say the poorly written newspaper that I held this morning has been sued by the government. That's a perfectly fine sentence, but it's referring to three different senses of a simple word like newspaper. So a newspaper can simultaneously be a piece of information, it can be a physical object, it can be an abstract organization, and we can also call upon all of these senses at once. And yet notice that this sentence cannot possibly refer to anything in the world. There's nothing, this is not a kind of thing that a physicist could explore. Uh, something that's poorly written, something that you hold, something that can be sued, it's not a coherent entity. Uh, and yet language allows this um, simple polysemous word, one single lexical item, to generate a very rich range of perspectives to interpret experience, which is exactly what you would expect from the active inference framework. And so since there can't possibly be any object in the external world that a complex polysemous word like newspaper can index a one-to-one -one mapping with, under the framework we are developing here, lexical items could partially be seen as hypotheses about the structure of likely co-occurring sensory input, right? Or hypotheses about ontological and myriological relations between objects and states in the world. So in other words, a word is not simply something that has a conceptual meaning. A word does not simply fetch concept. And a word is basically a, hypo a hypothesis about what the world is, what we can uh, interpret experience to be in any given moment. And we basically test the hypothesis. So we use the word newspaper as a hypothesis about what's going on outside. And maybe it fails, maybe it su succeeds. It depends on the context, it depends on our state of mind, and it also depends on our interests um, and our concerns. I'll give some more examples um, in a second just to kind of illustrate that. So a recent paper by uh, Carl Christen's lab, uh, headed by Demika Setal, 2020, in a paper in Frontiers, they note that from the perspective of active inference, Things only exist as a label or hypothesis or inference about hidden states. So the contention that I'm kind of presenting here is that forms of complex meaning derived from natural language semantics form a core component of this labeling mechanism and active inference. So linguists like to talk about, you know, lexical items, or book, table, walk, and so on. These are basically just hypotheses composed from distinct core knowledge systems in the mind. So our sense of geometry, our sense of place, our sense of social relations which can elucidate environmental regularities essential to active inference. So here's some more examples. Um, again, a nice little quote from uh, Demikas, the, the labeling quote. Um, let's take the uh, notion of vagueness. So I was once an infant, um, but I'm no longer an infant, but I'm still me, right? And the boundary between infancy and childhood and childhood and adulthood, uh, there are legal terms for that, but that's kind of a just arbitrary choice. The actual concept of infancy is an arbitrary boundary. Uh, mm, some philosophers do actually think that there is a specific nanosecond which transitions you from in infancy to childhood, but you know, I, I, I think that's unlikely. I think applying fixed quant quantified uh, uh, notions like that to uh, 
intentionally and inherently vague notion, like infancy, is kind of a paradox. It's meaningless. You know, infancy is just infancy. It's not meant to be a precise boundary, uh, unless you're a legal scholar, in which case that's fine. You can you know, define legal, legal boundaries between things, but that's kind of irrelevant for cognitive science. So consider something like infancy. Uh, you also have things like pile. So we say there's a pile of sand, and you keep taking uh, uh, bits of sand off. At what point, um, how many grains of sand are sufficient for to, to make a pile, right? That's called the Cerati's paradox. Um, the notion of the vague notion of pile is great for active inference. It's great for generating rapid inferences and assessments. But you know, as soon as you actually interrogate it sufficiently, it, the system becomes exposed. The system's flaws become exposed once you're actually subjected to all that much scrutiny. And then same for things like a uh, book. Uh, imagine you go into a library and there's, let's say, a thousand physical books, but there's only um, 800 kind of actual abstract books in the sense that, you know, every library has multiple copies of different books. So the library will have, you know, 10 copies of the Bible, uh, 10 copies of the Quran and so on. Uh, let's say J uh, John goes into the library and he reads every book in the library and then leaves the library because uh, he's fed up and all the books are rubbish. So we just assess the decides to burn it down. In that case, uh, you can say John burned every book in the library, or John read and burned every book in the library, in which case he burned more books than he read, right? He actually burns um, a thousand books, but he only reads 800 books. So the phrase every book does not pick out a fixed quantity. There's nothing in the external world that actually um, exhibits a one-to-one -one relation in terms of quantification. It could be 800, it could be a thousand. It depends on our perspective. And that's the crucial thing about even simple words like book. They generate these very rich polysemous perspectives that you can use to interpret experience but have no necessary component to them. Another example is something like a city. So you can say London burned down and was rebuilt 50 miles up the Thames. Um, London can still be London, even though it's physically completely changed. It's in a different location. All the Londoners are dead um, and so on. Uh, London has a very complex polysemous sense that you can decompose into organization sense, uh, loca location sense, uh, population sense, and so on, government institution. Um, but the single word London does not refer to anything in the world. So in other words, there's no such, there's no such thing as London. That's just a kind of uh, convenience. It's a, a convenient abstraction that we use to interpret experience. Um, but there's nothing, that, uh, there's nothing in the world that the word London refers to, right, coherently. Uh, you can use the word London to refer, but that's an action. It's an act of human will to actively do that and choose to do that. So it's a choice and it's an action. Again, well in the code of active inference. You can choose to voluntarily and willfully refer to one specific component of your representation of, of, of a city to refer to something in the external world. But that's a context by context case. The, the idea that London invariantly refers to a particular structure is just not, not, just not true. So by permitting a, a more refined, accurate positioning in conceptual space, Natural language syntax aids agents in the formation of uh, novel policies uh, to navigate and make inferences about the environment. So cognition is um, an ongoing process of dynamic interaction between an organism and its environmental niche. Uh, yet notions like event are also not predefined external entities, but are actively generated and parsed by the language system. Um, so again, events are not things in the world, and um, events are things that the mind uh, constructs. So uh, consider also that simple lexical items like city have properties that go way beyond the semantic complexity of other atomic representations. So you can say the large school with large windows next to the river starts at 9 a.m. and has a strict headmaster and unruly students. So there's nothing in the experimental world that could possibly be a location, an artifact, an event, a social group, right? Surely not. Absolutely, that, that, that's not an ontology. And also using these kinds of sentences surely doesn't commit us to the belief that there are such things in the world. It's a convenient abstraction. It's a fiction, right? It's basically a fiction, a useful fiction that is used in the service of active inference. And it does a very good job of it. It's very, uh, it's very successful. And the fact that it's so successful is evidenced by the fact that philosophers have only just begun to really investigate this phenomenon. This, this phenomenon is called complex polysemy. And it's taken centuries of inquiry to actually realize that some of our, our most basic common nominals uh, do not have reference to things in the world. They're just convenient fictions. So take another sentence, the average man is concerned about wage cuts because he needs to afford insurance. Does language commit us to the belief that the world is made of things like average men and wage cuts and relations of concern, right? That's not surely not something that we're committed to. Uh, London can be, as I said, London can be fun and polluted and burned down and rebuilt, rebuilt 10 miles up the river and still be called London. Uh, so these nested tree structures that I mentioned earlier are widely considered to be abstract, 
Well, even simple words exhibit considerable abstraction. So, in other words, the, 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 the paper I've written uh, with Friston and, and Holmes focuses on nested tree structures, um, but it's also worth pointing out that even simple words themselves uh, exhibit a considerable degree of, of abstraction. And perhaps just as relevant here is Bertrand Russell's invitation for us to consider uh, a blind physicist who knows all the physics, right, in some kind of hypothetical physics complete scenario. So what is it that a sighted person knows that the blind physicist doesn't know, uh, if this physicist knows everything? Certain experience of content, surely, right? So what it's like to see the color red. That's not part of the blind physicist's knowledge. So therefore, physics can only capture the causal skeleton of the world. We can at least conclude from this that my experience of seeing the color red simply is a property of the world, but one that we can't provide any naturalistic account for. And the reason why I mention that is because I think that may also be the case for, for, for words like London and City and Book. These abstractions are considerably uh, much more detailed, much more intricate, and much more complex than we usually give them credit for. Uh, our minds have, have, have managed to achieve an analysis of the concept of number. Right, number theory is very rich, a very uh, serious uh, field in, in mathematics about, about number theory. Um, but there isn't really much of an analog in linguistics. So lexical semantics is nowhere near as robust, nowhere near as detailed, and nowhere near as sophisticated as number theory. Okay? Lexical semantics is pretty much the meaning of water is you know, the set of all things that are water. That's basically it. If you pick up a semantics textbook, Semantics textbooks are pretty much just that. Like the meaning of the meaning of it is raining just means uh, you know it's raining, right? That's it. It's just like a redescription. And um, so, in other words, linguists are very far from actually having a serious naturalistic account for even some of the most simplest words, um, which again might be just, might just simply be because of our uh, cognitive limitations, right? We can't actually construct theories for these objects. And um, so, one one of the kind of ways to exhibit this rich polysemy is by looking to the philosophy literature. So in the philosophy literature, um, there's something called externalism, which is the position that I've just been critiquing, which is the idea that words can have a kind of one-to-one uh, -one reference with uh, things in the external world. And there was a survey conducted not too long ago, which showed that the majority of philosophers are externalists. They, they, they do believe, in fact, that you know the word water refers to H2O or whatever. So consider this famous um, thought experiment, which I think con contributes to our understanding of, of active inference, as I'll show in, in a few slides. In, in some parallel universe, it said that water is not made of H2O, but rather some other substance, right, X, Y, Z. So in the parallel universe, planet F2, the exact same as planet F1, except water is not made of H2O, it's X, Y, Z. So the question is, can the inhabitants of this twin Earth use water to refer to the substance? So external say no. Externalists say the, the meaning of water can't be applied to the substance. Um, on the other hand, in, contrary, in contrast to the externalists, there's what's called the internalist position, which says that the meaning of words is simply uh, a conceptual structure, and that's it. There's, no, there's nothing uh, in the external world that, that these things refer to. So the internalists obviously say yes, of course it can, because it's just a concept. Um, so the term water seems to be polysemous between some more kind of common function-based sense and a more concrete a like technical sense. So you can imagine that, um, let's, let's say one of the examples that Noam Chomsky has given is, imagine that there's a, a tea factory that kind of you know, explodes and some of the tea leaves in the factory get into the local water system. Uh, and so what comes out of someone's tap is chemically identical to the cup of tea that they're making in the kitchen. And yet one of them, one of the substances is water and one of the substances is tea, even though they're chemically identical, right? Chemically the same thing, and yet one of them's water and one of them is T. And the reason why is because it doesn't set, one of them satisfies the functional based criteria and the other one violates it. Uh, indeed, you can imagine an, another parallel universe. So then um, Paul Petrovsky offers what he calls fraternal Earth, where doppelgangers of our scientists discover that when um, what they've all been loosely calling mud, in fact, has a deep uniform structure. So obviously on planet Earth, our planet Earth, um, there's no uniform structure to mud, right? Mud can be anything. But it turns out that in this parallel universe, uh, all of their uh, examples of substances of, of mud actually exhibit a uniform structure, X, Y, Z. Uh, and so the argument is that they can use the concept of mud to refer successfully to all physical structures of mud. Okay? And that's, that's good for them, right? They could successfully use the word mud to just refer to X, Y, Z. But does it follow from this that the inhabitants of fraternal Earth could not then travel to our universe and use the word mud to refer to our chemically diverse samples? If they, if they came to a black hole? And I think the answer is no. The externalists would say yes, right? The externalists would say, well, their meaning of mud simply refers to X, Y, Z. 
And since we don't have X, Y, Z in our universe, when these people jump in a black hole and come to us, uh, when they talk of mud, they have to be speaking of something else. But that surely violates the actual meaning of the term mud. It's a conceptual representation. It's not a physical structure. So the idea that the natural kind of forming use of mud could not readily be extended to a polysimous sense doesn't really seem to be well supported. And it's just not a good description of what language actually is or what it cares about. Language doesn't really care about the world. It's, it's, it cares about, what I say, you know, it doesn't care about the external world as it actually is. It, it's not, it's, that's what science tries to do. Science tries to achieve re reference to things in the world. But the language system just cares about uh, active inference. It just cares about making sense of the world. That's it. It doesn't actually care if, if water's made of H2O or not, right? That's not relevant. So we can use simple words like water and wood to access multiple concepts and then use those concepts in the service of active inference. In fact, Petrosky goes further and he shows that using government statistics, US government statistics, he notes how Diet Coke has a higher percentage of H2O than stuff from my well. In fact, I'm drinking uh, a bottle of Dr. Pepper. I'm not sure if it actually has that information, but uh, Dr. Pepper has almost definitely a greater content of H2O than stuff from uh, the well in your backyard. Uh, and in fact, diet Sprite and Club Soda are even more like H2O, and yet they're not deemed water for reasons purely to do with intended purposes, right? So I, I, I think a, a cup of tea is like 99.7 or 99.5% H2O, uh, and yet it's called a cup of tea, right? It's not water, it's tea. Uh, so moving even further away from this, consider that even scattered entities, forget about water, let's talk about scattered entities. Scattered entities can be taken to be a single physical object under some conditions. So imagine a picket fence with brakes, or a, a, a colder mobile, right? The latter is a thing. Um, a colder mobile is called a thing, whereas a collection of leaves on a tree is not a thing. Uh, unless, of course, these leaves are placed for like the purposes of decoration or art installation. And so the reason seems to be that the mobile is created by an act of human will. Again, the functional notion is important here. So here's the question. How are these human-specific notions of function and intention coded into the lexicon? And how are they coded as part of any gender model under active inference? That's a really tricky question, right? Um, and indeed, going beyond this too, Bertrand Russell uh, famously claimed that objecthood is based on spatial-temporal contiguity, uh, but that also seems to be not sufficient. So the four legs of a dog could be seen as a single object under many conceivable contexts, such as if they were you know, cut off, tied together, and used as a doorstep, but they could still be understood by its user as part of a dog. So abstract objects do not bear causal relationships, and they're also not spatial-temporally located. So an object is usually understood to be a concrete thing, hence the confusion, you know, when some are denied uh, spatial temporal relations. So an object is an object if we deem it so. And in addition, I think it's important to note that a psycholinguistic lens is needed too. So when, when philosophers talk about externalism and internalism, they often just talk about uh, language without actually knowing anything about linguistics, which is kind of like a philosopher of physics, uh, like a philosopher, a philosopher of physics trying to do philosophy of physics without knowing anything about physics. That's kind of strange, right? If you want to do philosophy of linguistics, philosophy of language, you should really know about linguistics. So here's one particular um, paradox. In the philosophy literature, the following contrast has been called a paradox, like a problem. So you can say Batman fights more mobsters than Bruce Wayne, and, but we also know that Bruce Wayne just is Batman, right? So therefore, we should be able to say Batman fights more mobsters than Batman, right? But we can't say that because it sounds weird. And the reason why is, is due to linguistics. It's not because of philosophy. So it turns out there's a constraint on discourse interpretation in language through which whenever there's two referential expressions in a clause, they're default interpreted as non-identical, okay? And this feeds into non, uh, redundant computation, which again, feeds back to efficient computation. And as such, reference is obviative. So if you have two instances of Batman, there's a problem. So the sentence in B forces us to search for different reference, even though we know it's the same reference, right? So this paradox in philosophy of language is not due to mind-world relations. It's just due to linguistics. It's just a psycholinguistic phenomenon. That's all it is. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, and again, one of the problems here is that a lot of these uh, quirks of language demand interrogation, and they're not immediately obvious. They kind of, language is very good at constructing an illusion that we kind of become susceptible to. We like to think that um, the things we talk about uh, are really, really existing in the world. Uh, but in fact, you know, language use, I like to think of it as kind of a fairy tale. You know, using language is kind of more akin to the c constructing a fairy tale than it is science because we're just constructing concepts and using them in a kind of loose Wittgensonian language game sense. So here's another example, uh, what are called Escher sentences. So there's a, there's a famous uh, staircase painting of Escher. The endless staircases go round and round and round. Uh, so the, the visual system doesn't care about that. The visual system just sees what it sees. If the world, if that turns out to be a physically impossible construct, 
that's not relevant to the visual system, right? We just see whatever it sees. And it's the same with language too. So language also has things like analogous things, what are called Escher sentences. So if you say more people have been to Russia than I have, or um, in Michigan and Minnesota, more people found Mr. Bush's ads negative than they did Mr. Kerry's, that's actually a meaningless sentence. It doesn't mean anything, right? More people have been to Russia than I have is a meaningless sentence. It kind of sounds like it makes sense, but it's completely meaningless, right? Because you're, you're trying to compare a fixed finite quantity, like 50, to a simple binary yes or no, right? You've ever been to Russia, yes or no? And then more people means five or six people, right? So it's, it's syntactically legal, but it's semantically incoherent. And there's plenty of sentences like that where it's kind of, a language system is very good at uh, 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 generating the illusion of meaning, but generating the illusion of, of structure, when in fact, if you interrogate it, there's no, there's no meaning there. And again, this feeds into the idea of A, efficient computation, of, our, of inference generation. Doesn't, you know, the language system doesn't want to interrogate too deeply. It just wants to generate an inference. Right? What, what is this person trying to say here? Okay? And on the other hand, it also, generate, it also feeds into the idea of like, anti-reference. So this sentence sounds uh, meaningful, but there's nothing in the external world that it can refer to. So there's no real comparisons being made here between more people and me being, uh, being to Russia, yes or no. So in conclusion, it seems that any object is much more than its material constitution or its function. Uh, we can also use its origin. So Thomas Hobbes talked about rivers. His famous example was a river can be maybe defined by its origin and they can kind of skirt and diverge and, 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 and go into different paths and then maybe converge again. Um, but also a sense of continuity. So John Locke's theory of personhood was that you know a person is defined by a sense of continuous identity and not physical constitution. Um, so when a child watches a cartoon of, of a, you know, the handsome prince getting kissed, he turns into a frog, and then he turns into, uh, uh, you know, a, a human again once he's kissed again or whatever. Uh, there's a curse and then and something happens. The child knows that it's the same person, right? The child watching the TV knows that it's the same entity, it's the same person, uh, that the prince being turned from a human to a frog. And yet, again, that's got nothing to do with reference. There's nothing that could coherently uh, exist in that sense. So all these uh, uh, representations seem to inspire. And in addition, we also have a kind of a fifth element. So we can kind of call this extra linguistic biases, the shaping objecthood. So that pertains to one example. There are lots of examples, but one example is default marking of object surfaces. So if you say John painted the house brown, this implies that he painted the external surface brown, not the internal surface. Because we seem to have a sense of objects as being uh, concave objects. And uh, same with scenes as well, like scenes, events are kind of, you know, we're inside scenes or outside scenes. So we seem to have a kind of uh, visually imposed sense of what our house is. So if John and Mary are both stood five meters from the surface of the house, but Mary's inside the house and John's outside it, uh, John is near the house, but Mary's not near the house. Right? Mary's inside the house, even though they're both equidist, the actual physical structure of the house. So the house is, again, a functional notion. It's not just a physical object. It's also a, a kind of a functional-based interpretation. Um, so in other words, at least these five components, they all contribute to active inference. They all contribute to generating structures. But at least these five components are somehow encoded in language. And I consider that to be uh, one of the biggest mysteries in, in linguistics. Right? How are these things encoded in the, in the lexicon? And how are, these th how are these networks across the brain interpreted and activated during language comprehension? That's an extremely problematic you know, issue. Because when we, like I said, when we talk about schools being, having strict headmasters and being large and near the river and uh, et cetera, um, we're using pretty much all of these concepts at once, and we're doing it effortlessly. Um, and yet, somehow, how they're actually implemented is, is kind of a mystery. But there is, interestingly, precedence in recent active inference literature for these suggestions. So, in a recent paper, Ramsted et al. argue that the FAP is most compatible with an instrumentalist theory of mental representations, via which representations are useful fictions for explanatory goals, right? Which is exactly what I've just been saying about linguistics. And this is also, also compatible with uh, certain models in philosophy of language, the internalist perspective, which assume that lexical items have no one-to-one -one direct reference in the external world, but are basically useful fictions. They're composites of distinct representational domains that are used for successful, efficient interpretation and ultimately agent survival, right? Uh, and it's also compatible with internalist models of Markov blankets, uh, which have been argued to be to form kind of neo-Kantian and help, help function the council of cognition whereby the boundaries of cognition are delimited by the school, emphasizing the interactive, constructive nature of higher cognition and in generating interpretable, actionable concepts, right? Again, the crucial concept of actionable concept. It's a useful concept. It's something that you can, you know, use in, in some meaningful way. 
So the long-term storage of uh, frequently generated lexical occurrences and the combinatorial rules underlying their creative deployment in language production and comprehension. All of this seems to allow speakers to categorize novel sensory data into a discrete set of objecthood and eventhood representations. So there are a few events that cannot actually be passed through the, the simple and unique schemes provided by, by language, which increases the likelihood of speakers uh, avoiding surprising states. The more efficiently and readily you can pass a particular situation as an event, then that uh, leads to the uh, surprise minimization, right? So another recent paper notes that the active inference model of the brain assumes an imperative to find uh, the most accurate explanation for sensory observations that is minimally complex, which has been recruited in Barlow's exploration of minimum redundancy, and which seems to uh, accord with how the language system provides the most computationally efficient format for solving the problem of mapping linear sensory input, right? So linear sentences to hierarchical interpretations. So from the perspective of active inference, individuals need to minimize the effort involved in meaning making. So we propose that there is increasing evidence from theoretical linguistics and natural language syntax and that this structure exhibits design principles in keeping with least set criteria. So another recent paper by Kristen, uh, Kristen's group proposes that the goals of speech uh, segmentation involve sampling data in a way that requires the most parsimonious degree of belief updating in accord with Bakum's principle. So we've basically extended these claims to the domain of natural language. Uh, indeed, active inference has only one underlying imperative to minimize generalized free energy or uncertainty. And much work in psycholinguistics, so things like eye tracking, you know, tracking people's eye movements during the reading of sentences, uh, during fill gap dependencies, uh, you know, long distance dependencies and sentences where kind of elements have to relate or agree with in features. Um, it shows that phrase structures are generated predictively in anticipation of upcoming stimuli. In fact, it turns out that even something as simple as adjective noun phrases are constructed predictively. So things like red boat, simple two word phrases, they involve rich prediction. So maybe I should just stop there for a second to evaluate and. This has been a uh, awesome learning experience as a non linguist. There's a few questions from the chat, and there's also just a few other things I wrote down, but a lot of the questions have to do with how things happen in the brain. So maybe yeah. it's worthwhile for you to just um, share however much more you'd like to share, and then hang out as long as you'd like to answer some questions, and you're always welcome back. So, you know, no worries, just whatever's comfortable today, let's talk through, and then we'll continue the discussion. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, uh, this is the final section, just to kind of wrap it all up together. So. Um, only a few, a few, a few slides more for that. Yeah, the question of how all this relates to the brain is absolutely essential. And um, so, I'll try and explain that. So, just to begin with that framework, uh, yeah. So so far, I've kind of just outlined the kind of basic philosophy of uh, how language is implemented in in, in in a kind of computational theory, uh, how it seems to be involved in efficient computation and so on, how it might, uh, on a cognitive level, contribute to inference generation. Uh, but what about actual neural implementation? So that's, that's, the, that's the kind of the next frontier. So there's a recent paper by Van Rouge and Baggio um, arguing that what makes a good theory is not just generating testable predictions, it's invoking plausible possible mechanisms, mechanisms that are plausibly realized in nature, either in neurobiology or genetics or physics, right? It's kind of a, a, a nice framework. The idea is that uh, theory is not just there just, just, just because they can uh, generate um, you know, true uh, testable predictions. It's, it's, it's to generate things that are plausible. Um, I think that's a very important point. So much of current um, uh, the neurobiology of language involves quite reasonably testing some hypotheses um, and then generating poorly uh, variable explanations for results. So you'll read the results section, uh, which shows, like, let's say, hippocampal theta power increases automatically coherent sentences, maybe, just to choose a random example. And so the explanation is just kind of a redescription of the results in the description section. So it'll be like, you know, we found. Uh, hippocampal theta increases in X, Y, Z. Um, uh, so therefore, semantically coherent sentences are indexed by hippocampal theta. Okay, it's kind of a redescription. But then, what we need is really a pre-existing mechanistic understanding of the possible computational properties of hippocampal theta. So, what is hippocampal theta in the first place, right? Otherwise, what's the point of looking at it? There's no point looking at some neural response if you don't understand the computational capacities of that neural response. What is that property? What is that lower-level mechanism? And indeed, there might be, and there usually are multiple mechanisms, multiple possible mechanisms for realizing that particular signature that you get through, through brain data. Um, 
well, if your if your simple output is to simply do the experiment and then re-describe the results using different rhetoric, then that's not contributing to um, you know conceptual uh, progress. So a lot of these ideas were uh, outlined in a recent book of mine, the oscillatory nature of language. And um, so I'm kind of just going to uh, tease them apart. But if you're interested in more of the details, you're you know, free to contact me, and I'll send you a copy. So one can derive some elementary properties of linguistic computation through a direct line of communication from the FPP through to endogenous oscillatory synchronicity and linguistic behavior, which kind of comes out of the output. So under the FPP, endogenous oscillations are the type of dynamics, brain dynamics, that neurons would expect to encounter, since they have genetically encoded beliefs that the cause of the excitatory postsynaptic potentials follows a certain pattern. So active inference can synthesize various in silico neurophysiological responses via a gradient descent on free energy, such as the mismatch negativity, phase precession, theta sequences, place cell activity, uh, theta gamma, uh, phase amplitude coupling, and so on. Um, and the reason why that's important is because a lot of these mechanisms have been involved and implicated in language. So moving forward with these concerns, neuronal dynamics and plasticity appear to minimize variational free energy under a simple generative model, which entails prior beliefs that presynaptic inputs are generated by an external state with a quasi-periodic orbit. Recent paper showed this. So the implication is that ensembles of neurons make inferences about each other, while individual neurons minimize their own free energy. So generalized synchrony uh, kind of comes for free. It's an emergent property of free energy minimization. Desynchronization is induced by exogenous input, explaining event-related desynchronization, and structure learning emerges in response to causal structure in exogenous input, explaining the functional segregation of neuronal clusters. So an external, like neuron external state with a quasi-periodic orbit is assumed to generate the presynaptic inputs of a given neuron. And what's interesting for me is that low frequency phase synchronization emerges directly from this assumption. And also the coupled assumption that neuronal dynamics maximize variational free energy. So the reason why that's important for language is that one particular implication is that models of syntactic syntactic computation grounded in these dynamics. So yeah, the, the, the model that I have in my book, but also some other recent models from Giroud, Gofeld, and uh, Tabana et al. can be said to comply with foundational principles of the FAP. So for instance, endogenous low frequency delta, delta phase tracking of syntactic nodes could be seen as emerging as a direct function of generative belief updating in a core of active inference, supplementing the association of delta oscillations with the cortical computations responsible for creating hierarchical linguistic structures. So what that means is whenever you get a particular phrasal node, i.e. a phrase boundary, you seem to get some kind of unique low frequency response. So the details can be found in the, in, the, in the actual papers, but there's basically some kind of unique low frequency signature, which seems to code, okay, this is a phrase, here's another phrase, here's another phrase. And that kind of goes beyond the uh, level of, of, of abstraction uh, contributed by syllables and words. So it's kind of a phrase-specific uh, signature. Uh, and so the active inference framework provides clear predictions about the neural dynamics of language and can help bring together research programs that are presently pursued independently. So exploring the possible neurobiological basis of a core feature of language, a recent paper argues that theta gamma phase amplitude coupling in language, which codes syllable recognition, and also predicted coding, um, theta gamma coupling has been associated with predictive coding for a little while now, can be brought together. So this theta gamma coupling has been applied to syllable parsing, modeling theta gamma coupling for dialogue as well, which appears to form part of belief updating for active inference, whereby beliefs are simultaneously updated at high, fast levels, but also low, slower levels. Um, also, uh, theta gamma coupling has been applied to uh, a constraint, well, it's been assumed to be a constraint in working memory. So for instance, the idea is that the number of items you can hold in working memory is based on the number of gamma cycles you can embed in a given uh, theta phase. And there's a kind of trade-off between fidelity. If you want to have uh, hold more items in memory, then you can indeed increase the number of gamma items to you know seven or eight gamma cycles within the theta cycle, about seven or eight. But then that lowers the actual resolution. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's been shown that there's a relationship between number of items held and uh, uh, physical causal manipulation of theta gamma coupling in, in people's skulls using some kind of extra you know, tax or, or TMS and their actual performance in, in working memory tasks. So theta gamma does in fact seem to be causally implicated in just constructing sets in working memory, um, which I think is kind of a cool idea. So in this particular model, phrase level inferences generate words contained within the phrase before lower levels reset for the next phrase, right? Manifested as theta, theta phase alignment. 
So each transition at the higher level is accompanied by a resetting at the lower level state. So this is in line with the suggestion that low frequency phase can coordinate the bundling of lexical features indexed by fast gamma cycles within a given structure via forms of cross frequency coupling, namely phase amplitude coupling and also phase phase coupling, ensuring serial readout of features alongside the transfer of syntactic identities to language external systems. So there's the kind of top down um, information between uh, different types of phase amplitude coupling. This is kind of elaborated in my, in my book. But the basic idea is that low frequency phases coordinate and, and set the identity of whatever discrete representations are being fetched and linearized and combined and chunked via these uh, uh, faster gamma, gamma cycles cross cortically. Uh, cross cortically just means whatever part of the brain happens to be responsible for storing the representations that you care about. Again, language is very good at talking about uh, extracting, fetching concepts from different domains. So that would yield predictions for which cortical surfaces are being extracted and kind of took, spoken to by this uh, uh, low frequency phase coordination uh, uh, operation. So theta gamma coupling has also formed part of recent models of scheduling and updating the list of syntactic semantic features being associated with a given chunk of linguistic stimuli, with gamma cycles indexing distinct data structures being coordinated by theta phase. Data structures just means linguistic features, so semantic or syntactic features, right? Like first person, uh, number, gender features, what have you. So these proposals are potentially analogous from a neurocomputational perspective. So you have the same lower level generic algorithm, neurocomputational algorithm, that's simply fetching discrete domain specific uh, representations, which also kind of feeds back into the Haynes idea I mentioned earlier, where you have these different systems, morality, music, mathematics, language, where the computation seems to be analogous, but the representations are different. So the same computation operating over different representational domains. So through specifying a process theory that explains neuronal responses during perception and action, Neuronal dynamics have previously been cast as a gradient flow on free energy. So that is to say, any neural process can be formulated as a minimization of the same quantity used in approximate phase inference. So the brain seeks to minimize free energy, which is mathematically equivalent to maximizing vital evidence. Uh, and so this view of neuronal responses can be conceived uh, with respect to Hamilton's principle of, of least action. Right? So all these ideas kind of weave together. And in fact, recently, a deep temporal model for communication uh, was developed based on a simulated conversation between two synthetic subjects. Uh, showing that certain behavioral and neurophysiological correlates of communication arise under variational message passing, in particular, theta gamma coupling, right? So theta gamma coupling arose from this particular synthetic dialogue. So the model of syntax I've assumed in the paper assumes that syntax, uh, sorry, in this particular paper by Kristen, assumes that syntaxes are sequences of states or words with a terminal node at the end of every sentence. So a kind of phrase boundary, like, like a wrap-up effect, right? Like a, a consolidation period. Uh, with each form of syntactic structure being limited to uh, questions and answers in a game of 20 questions in this particular paper. Um, but the conclusion of this paper are, are pretty much in keeping with core assumptions in linguistics concerning the inherently constructive nature of language. So elementary syntactic units, which are highly robust and conserved across speakers of the same language, provide specific um, belief structures that are used to reduce uncertainty about the world through rapid and reflexive categorization of events, states, and objects, and their relations, again, in compliance with the FEP. Uh, sentential representations can be thought of as structures designed partially to consolidate and appropriately frame experiences and to contextualize and anticipate future experiences. So the range of possible syntactic structures available to comprehenders provides alternative, uh, alternate hypotheses that afford parsimonious explanations for sensory data, and as such, they preclude overfitting. So if the complexity of the linguistic stimuli can be efficiently mapped to a small series of regular syntactic formats, this contributes to the brain's goal of restricting itself to a number of states, as I mentioned earlier. And again, by mapping syntactic structures to conceptual systems in a manner adhering to principles of economy, language can be seen as engaging in a series of questions and answers with sensory data itself, right? but also with non-linguistic mental states. And only through natural language can we generate the full complexity of WH questions, you know, the questions I mentioned before, cross serial dependencies, long distance dependencies, where different elements uh, across different structures depend on each other, uh, fully gap dependencies and so on, which permit an expansion of what kinds of querying the brain can execute over sample data. So in other words, only with natural language syntax can the brain execute these particular type of queries mm. and generate new processes. So all the ways that language centered aspects, again, if you recall what I mentioned at the beginning, all of the ways that language-centered aspects of human cognition can be motivated through conformity to the FEP and active inference, so things like communication and narratives, 
all of that can actually be further be derived from a more elementary focus on syntactic computational complexity. And in fact, there was a paper published a couple of days ago, um, by again by Kristen's lab, which showed that neural dynamics under active inference are metabolically efficient and suggest that neural representations uh, in biological agents may evolve by approximating steepest descent in the information space towards the point of optimal inference. And again, there's a pretty not, that's not a bad idea to pursue in, in connection to neurolinguistics in terms of the um, optimal inferences afforded by not just syntactic structures, but again, also lexical semantics, so individual words that I mentioned before. So just moving to a couple of conclusions from the slides. Um, I've tried to show that natural language syntax renders meaning making and high order inference a computationally efficient process, and it seemingly makes it work right for what the cost et al. call uh, as a key question for future research for active inference which is how biological organisms effectively search large policy spaces when planning into the future. So regardless of whether you, know, you actually assume particular economy conditions, uh, X, Y, or Z, my motivation has been kind of more general. It's just been to consider how the FPP can, in principle, provide a novel explanation for the prevalence of efficiency encoded linguistic rules. And indeed, other linguists might disagree with me and, and, and disagree with the actual framing and maybe the other linguistic frameworks, like maybe Ray Jekindoff's framework of parallel architecture. That might be more um, appropriate too, depends on your background assumptions. Yeah. So it's specifically natural language syntax and, ex and its capacity for sentential complexity that allows language users to expand the scope of their predictions about their future positions in the state space. They can think of more possible future scenarios, right, and plan for them accordingly. So we've arrived at a number of suggested explanations for the way language implements the construction of hierarchical syntactic objects, namely to minimize uncertainty about the causes of sensory data to unveil a species unique format of external hidden states, to adhere to a uh, least effort principle. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, in some cases, this involves externalization, but not always. So exploring our, uh, this proposal empirically may demand a more mature development of the science of computational complexity in the brain. So I basically argue that all of the ways that language syntax is a permission to be motivated for the FFP can simply be grounded through syntax. So in other words, narratives are strong candidates for constructs adhering to active inference, um, but the generation of syntactic phrase structures is a necessary feature of any narrative, right? You need to at least construct a phrase to generate a narrative. So I've reviewed how the FEP that underwrites active inference is an expression of the principle of the action, which is additionally a principle implemented in models of, of syntax. So ultimately, both the FEP and syntactic theory are empirically and conceptually well-supported constructs. And as, as I've argued, they share a number of intriguing commonalities. So while the FAP has produced formal simulation supported models of many complex cognitive mechanisms like action, perception, learning, and attention, and also communication, on the other hand, models of syntax have uh, explained grammaticality intuitions, certain poverty of stimulus issues, i.e. how kids acquire language, and the pervasive organizational role that hierarchy has in language. So hierarchies just seems to pretty much organize and determine almost all linguistic structures. Further, language is not, a, is not the only domain which exhibits economy, right? Uh, suggesting a deeper grounding of this bias in natural law. Other domains include uh, concept learning, cause of reasoning, central motor learning, and also, as I said before, memory. So importantly, active inference has been used to account for also creative functions that have to do with exploration and novelty. And the reason why that's important is because linguists have also long argued that the hallmark of natural language is actually its creative aspect, uh, the ability to freely construct an unbounded array of hi hierarchically organized expressions with novel interpretations. So you can say sentences that have never been said before. Uh, linguistic creativity can be framed in terms of adherence to physical thermodynamic conservativity if it does so to minimize uncertainty and unveil hidden states within an individual models of external state. So in other words, the more efficiently a language user can internally construct meaningful hierarchically organized structures, the more readily they can use these structures to contribute to the planning and organization of action consolidation, exogenous and endogenous monitoring, and adaptive environmental sampling. I think it's worth recalling Gregor Mendel's application of uh, complex algebra to botany. Uh, at the time, this was deemed by many people to be kind of weird and almost surreal. Uh, but in fact, the same may be true of novel conceptual directions um, for natural language syntax and semantics, right? Unconventional approaches uh, often soon turn out into you know, the new normal. Uh, only time can tell how far these directions can actually be pursued, though. Yeah, thank you for listening. Okay, so awesome. You can unshare, and then I hope we can ask a few of the questions. Yep. 
Yeah. Do you want to unshare your screen? Oh, great. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. All right. I will um just jump right in with the first question. I okay. again as a non linguist was like looking up a bunch of words, learning a lot. So really fascinating. The first question was, um, and I think it was related to when you said uh, that language is not just about communication, despite that being a common conception. So yeah. potentially it's about the structure of thought or the structure of thinking. So the question was, it would be great if Eliot could define what is his definition of thought and what is potentially the contribution of the intracranial language research towards answering the hard problem? Wow. Wow. So you, you started with the easy question, okay. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So um, I, I, I like to think of thought as um, I do any other language. It's kind of like a metaphor. So, um, you know, in, in some languages, um, when a, uh, a human being does a uh, long jump, they only jump. So in, in English, they, we just say they jump. In Japanese, they actually allow flying. So in, in if a long jumper, if a Japanese linguist uh, is at the Olympics and they see someone do high jump or long jump, they could technically say they're flying. Um, but it's just a metaphor. It's the same, I think it's the same with thought as well. So thought is just a metaphor. I don't think we have any, uh, it's not a well-defined scientific natural kind. It's kind of a useful convenience. So, but you know, that said, I think the way I see it is um, natural language syntax allows us to fetch particular uh, domain specific representations from all sorts of different cognitive domains and then construct them into novel interpretations. The important thing is that all of this is outside language. So the interpretation process is an extra linguistic process. The actual only, the only linguistic specific process is just combining a phrase, uh, just combining items, putting them together, and then shipping them off to an external interface for interpretation. And um, so that's the thought process. Um, I don't have any deep particular reflections on it. I think the best the, the best book about this is Paul Petrosky's uh, Conjoining Meanings that came out in 2018, um, which is the idea that what language contributes to thought is kind of what I said here today, like a kind of it, it uniquely encodes a kind of functional abstraction, um, whereas different cognitive subdomains like the visual system or the olfactory system, I guess, you know, the, 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 the um, uh, uh, sense of uh, number sense or geometric reasoning, these all contribute distinct sub representations of a given uh, sentence, but language seems to uniquely care about function, so abstract function. So I guess I would say that if linguistic thought um, can be defined at all, it's almost definitely going to closely approximate human-specific interests and concerns and needs and things like that, which is kind of surprising because like, a lot of people just think of language as kind of, um, um, you know, uh, in an unbiased way, communicating with um, the conceptual structures, like thought, like language is kind of a thought system. But I don't really see it that way. I kind of see as language does seem to bring with it some unique conceptual contributions. Uh, namely, it seems to encode these human-specific fun functions, um, which is why I said, you know, if you look at water, water cannot simply be defined as H2O. It's way too simplistic. It's the, the, the actual meaning of water is, is way beyond that. Um, and then with respect to intercranial stuff, I'm not too sure. Like so. Uh, intracranial research is fantastic at actually uh, examining in real time actual neural responses, right? So getting really down to the nitty gritty. It depends on the type of electrode that you have, its resolution, its uh, listening radius, uh, how much of cortex you can actually sample. And um, there's also something called the sparse sampling problem in, in intracranial research where you have very great coverage of specific uh, cortical loci. But then, of course, each patient will have different electrodes in different parts of the brain. There's no patient that has electrodes everywhere. They only have electrodes where their epilepsy is supposed to be targeted. So for research purposes, that obviously brings limitations. So I don't think we'll ever be able to have a coherent global whole brain in, in you know, intrapatient understanding. What we do is we summate, we combine across all these different patients and generate a more kind of average brain response, if that makes sense. Um, so in that sense, uh, it can contribute just the same way any other um, MEG or extracranial EEG can do. It depends on the paradigm, it depends on the uh, in the analysis. I think the real crucial point here is conceptual innovation. So what we really need is we have tons of data um, from uh, natural lang language experiments. We have loads of data, but we don't have all that much uh, conceptual uh, novelty. So uh, linguists are very good at coming up with very smart paradigms for, you know, very well carefully controlled experiments. But then when it comes to actual novel conceptual frameworks for how these things actually map onto brain processes, I think we need much more of that. So I think actually um, intracranial research 
will not be as uh, uh, useful as uh, conceptual, theoretical, um, uh, you know, uh, changes. I think that's much more important, actually. Uh, yeah. Well, one area of utility that you didn't even go into at all would be machine learning and the mm -hmm. long time challenge of natural language parsing and generation. And the recent approach has been throw the big neural network at it with the GPT and just large scale text modeling. And then yeah. that reminded me of what you said about multi-scale models, how we don't overfit the semantics, even when mm -hmm. we hear a ton of syllables. I really, 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 really am hungry. And then, um, you know, a computer might just spit out a P value. It's kind of like oversampling, yeah. but we don't want to oversample semantically. So there's going to be really interesting space for active inference models. Okay, here's the- Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, I'll go to the next question. Okay. Um, can free energy principle and this syntactic theory framework help explain how and why the brain computes inner speech the way that it does and provide the possibility to predict what's about to be computed in the future? So how do we think about externalizing speech like vocalization versus our inner experience of speech? Are those structured? Are those in our voice? Like what is happening? I think that, that's a really cool question. And but I think that I think there's also a lot of like misconceptions about this. So I actually don't see. So so most people think that um, you know external speech is kind of crude and you know it has nothing to do with thought. It's kind of out there. But internal speech is like some kind of angelic Platonic space, um, like a like like Plato's cave. But actually, I think that's the opposite. I think they're both the same. So um, internalized speech is basically internalized externalized speech. So when you speak, to, well, when you listen to yourself speaking in your in in a, in a monologue you're doing it in the format of externalized speech. You're not doing it in a different format. It's not as if, it's not as if inner speech has a different structure and a different encoding, and then external speech is something different. When I, when I think to myself, when I wake up in the morning, I still think to myself in English. I think to myself in linear sentences, right? That's, that's how the thought is, is externalized. So it's, this is why I said about the interface between language and conceptual systems. What's happening in inner speech is that you are externalizing in your own head so, in that, so inner speech is basically a form of externalization. Okay? Not all forms of externalization involve me literally saying things. You're still externalizing it, you're just externalizing it to yourself. So in other words, actual linguistic thought is, is pre-conscious, it, it's subconscious. And, and that's, that's why we need linguistics departments to kind of figure out, you know, what are these subconscious operations that are happening, right? So we have a bunch of subconscious merge operations that are happening, but we don't have direct conscious access to those. Uh, and why should we? There's no reason why we should do right. We, but we do have direct access to the externalized output in our um, kind of self-generated auditory encoding of that structure. So um, I can't I can't remember what the question was. Sorry, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that reminds me of thinking through other minds, um, mm. a recent paper in our you know active inference community, and then also um, yeah, there, there's just so many interesting aspects about how you really pointed to these domain general attributes of language. Mm -hmm. And yes, I'm rethinking language and some of the ways that we even communicate on the stream, because you'll see people say, I'm just not sure how to say it. And it's like, mm -hmm. but are you sure how to, how to think it? Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. actually, if we think through it, and then we have feedback writing, and we can, it's like stigmergy, we're making these meaning marks, and then we're reinterpreting that. And so it's going to be quite interesting there. Here's a, th a third question. Yeah. Um, thanks. Great talk. Given that the sequences are generated in nested hierarchical structures, where would linear externalization fit in here? Can we say that they're bound by linear externalizations? And then maybe if that's a linguistics term, what does that mean? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah it okay, is. great. Where do linear externalizations fit into here? Um, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what the questioner is is trying to ask. I kind of understand what they're saying. Um, so I guess the okay, okay. So it's it's typically assumed that um, linear externalization is like the output of, a, of of the syntactic system, and that it turns out upon further analysis that most of the world's languages uh, differences, the way that the world languages differ, is based on morphophonological differences. So in other words, the way that morphemes and sounds are produced. But the actual semantics and syntax is, is kind of fairly linear. So in other words, all the universal things about language are kind of alien. 
and all the differences in the world's languages occur very late on, so late in the interpretation process. So when you generate a structure that you want to say, you at least need to have the syntax first, because that's the most uniform structure. And then once you've got the syntax in place, you then go about doing, you know, filling in all the sound details. But the sound details are kind of irrelevant for, for, for language. That's just a, a, a un, a, an annoyance, basically, right? So I gave I gave you the example of English and Basque. So English and Basque have the same underlying phrase structure, but they linearize it in different ways. So um, they just happen to linearize it based on you know whatever arbitrary conventions happen to uh, arisen in, in those different cultures. But the actual interpretation is that is exactly the same. So I would say whatever whatever linearization, uh, whenever it happens, it happens late stage, and it happens as an inconvenience to the language system. Interesting. And sometimes people will point to different languages or a word that appears unique to even a cultural experience. But it's sort mm -hmm. of the other side of that coin is the truly 99.9% .9 that's structured functionally, like that can be translated. And so it is the exception that proves the rule, just like when we, we violate syntax sometimes to make a point like repeating a mm -hmm. word and then in our yeah. internal monologue maybe even like singing or alternate characters it's sort of like it's a dramatic externalization but That's it's right. the exception that proves the rule or it's kind of like the grandmaster chess player who, who violates a principle but that is is mastery over the syntax and we can't let those exceptions that prove the rule lead us to throw out the baby with the bathwater or however else they say it <laughs> but it, it by highlighting language as functional and the structure of thinking rather than like um rhetorical only in its deployment it was just connecting two nodes and you're really opening it up to think about what's inside of the cranium as well and taking measurements from there but it's what's happening with our thought that's being revealed in a linear string so 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 one of the um one of my favorite um Examples of uh, modern literature is magical realism. And magical realism is basically uh, com uh, put, getting a blender, putting lots of different random concepts in there, and blending them all together and seeing what comes out. So a lot of literary like novelty, literary conventions, uh, novels, poetry, is novel precisely because it just it's kind of experimental. It's saying, let's what happens when we put these two random different concepts together. Let's see if they can generate a meaningful interpretation that is either emotionally resonant or conceptually intriguing. And in fact, some of the most important poetry that's been written in the English language has violated rules of English grammar precisely to generate these novel interpretations. It kind of it's an it's an intentional violation of some kind of linguistic rule, which is an it's like a signal to the reader that there's a reason for this. It, it sends a message. It reflects something or whatever. Right. This, but yeah, absolutely. Like this, these these exceptions to the rule are extremely important to like to think about. My final question is mm -hmm. how might digital discourse and multimedia be influencing structure of language, structure of thought? Like, are we synchronizing on the functional aspects with memes or are we diverging in our narratives? So how is that playing out when it's more multimedia, visual, video than ever? Yeah. Less of it is spoken and read, which is the linearized sort of classical language and now there's unconventional languages so where does that how's that going to work yeah so so i mean i know that the capacity and the prevalence of like uh long-term digesting of like you know long sunday times articles is kind of declining and the propensity for bite-sized chunking information is like easy digestible it involves less critical thinking judgments ideological or otherwise can be made rapidly inferences can be made uh, and so on. Um, that is definitely on the rise. However, there was a, a linguistics book that came out, I believe around 2010. Um, I can't remember who it was by. Um, um, it was basically just analyzing the idea that, so around the turn of the century, obviously mobile phones came about, right? And everyone started texting and um, using all these different, so instead of saying please, you would say, you'd type PLZ. Uh, instead of saying mate, you'd say M8. Or whatever, all these different abbreviations. Um, and at the time, um, a lot of people in England were very concerned about this because they said, well, all our kids are going to be, you know, they're going to grow up stupid because they use all these uh, slang deviations of English. Uh, it turns out that there's almost no evidence that this affects intelligence, like people's ability to, you know, be smart and use language and identify language grammatically. Because in fact, when you think about it, if you use text language, um, 
if you open a WhatsApp chat and you start a new text with somebody and you use all these emojis and you use all these abbreviations for words, it presupposes that you actually know the correct version. Because in order to violate the rules, it presupposes that you understand them. So flouting the rules of grammar and flouting the rules of spelling actually exhibits comprehension of genuine uh, you know, rules of English, whatever you want to call them, right? And that was, the, that was the example that the linguist gave in this book on texting. Again, I can't remember it. But, um, uh, so I think that's a pretty good example of when this panic, this, this moral panic in, in, in society over like, you know, text, you know, it's, I, 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 the answer is I don't know. You know I have no idea. But, uh, on that sort of moral panic, I guess, yeah. the thought is like, um, then at some point, maybe even they forget how to spell it, P-L-E-A-S-E, you know, how to spell please. And then it's kind of like our word roots you know, oh, I can't believe you don't speak Greek enough to know that the word roots of this, it's like, it's become modularized. So units that were novelties at first and exceptions become reified within a cultural context, a shared niche and shared narrative so that like the crying emoji does mean this functionally. Uh -huh. And then uh -huh. someone could say, I can't believe that you don't know that it used to mean this in a different language. It's sort of like, it speaks to so many of these excellent themes. So yeah. 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 Elliot, yeah. awesome guest stream. Thanks for your first appearance. And we're cool. always looking forward to what you might want to share with us in the future. So thanks again. Yeah, totally. Well, yeah, this, this is an ongoing project, so I'm sure I'll have more to share in the future. And thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and thank you for the questions too. So yeah, totally. Thank you, Elliot, and to all audience. So see you later.